short demo by HK EOS and EOS Cafe Calgary, followed by EOS Tribe. Do we have EOS Tribe here? Eugene? Do we have Eugene here? Oh, Steve. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so that your position is number two, and then followed by Shios at number three. Hello, Yos. Hello, Yos is number four. That's right. Yos Africa. Yes, I see Kosi. Thank you. Yos Fish. Do we have Yos Fish? Yos Fish, please raise your hand. There you are, Marshall. Raise it. Raise it. All right. Yos 42. Do we have Yos 42? Going once, Yos 42. Yos 42. We need a rep from Yos 42 to join us on the right, please. All right, we may need some help. Roman, in the back, could you please announce there that a representative from EOS 42 needs to be in here? Thank you. All right, Salt Block. Do we have Salt Block? Yes, I see Adrian. Thank you. EOS Shenzhen. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And Starter EOS. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll. Cut to music for a few seconds, and then uh, I'll go out and physically push people in, and then we're going to get started. Thank you. Thank you. Music. All right. Please don't go anywhere. Stay here. Thank you. Can't promise. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started now. This is the Lightning BP presentation round. One final call for EOS 42. Charles from EOS 42, if you're here, please come to my right in that area. If anybody sees Charles from EOS 42, please ask him to come over here. But we'll get started. All right, so the rules of the game, as we set them out, were each team gets 90 seconds of actual mic time. After 90 seconds, their mic is gonna be cut. So you have 90 seconds to introduce yourself and your value proposition to the entire community. And uh, up first is HK Yos and Cafe Calgary. Come on, guys. Give them a nice round of applause. Hi, everyone. I'm Hugo from HK Yos. And I'm Saeed from EOS Cafe Calgary. Uh, both our teams have been focusing on building tools for the community since we joined the EOS movement. We've been part of uh, EOS Debug, Ghostbusters, and the uh, EOS Test Cave. So today we'd like to introduce our uh, new block explorer for the community, Blocks.io. It's the fastest block explorer for EOS. It's been under beta. Some of you have probably been using it for the last few weeks, and today we want to do our public announcement here um, in Korea. So we've built a, a block explorer with a seamless user experience by focusing on speed. 
uh, and completeness of information and also usability has been one of the biggest focus. And uh, if uh, Jay can go to one of the account pages, we, we've done a we've had a big focus on the account page because that's what most people use. So we've, we've added filters to accounts. You, don't, you won't see this anywhere, even in Ethereum Explorers or any other Explorer. We've added action level filtering. So you can filter by producer actions, receiving tokens, uh, sending tokens, RAM, account. So all the filters that uh, users need to make a block explorer easy to use. And as we said, blocks.io, the fastest block explorer out there. Thank you for your time. All right, EOS Tribe. You guys are up next. EOS Tribe. Come on. We want to keep this going sharp. Hey, guys. Hi, uh, Eugene Luzgin. I'm a technical founder of EOS Tribe. Uh, my partner, Steve Lloyd. Uh, we are international uh, BP. Uh, we, have, we are running on a bare metal servers, you know, very secure infrastructure. EOS, EOS Tribe is core team member of Ghostbusters team. We contributed into security standards for uh, block producer infrastructure. We also currently actively developing iPhone wallets and uh, uh, desktop wallet as well for EOS. And I let Steve talk about projects. Um, I'm the UX arm of EOS Tribe, Steve Floyd. Uh, I focus on usability. Uh, I helped actively develop some of the UI for EOS Portal.io that helped activate the chain. Um, a big push that we're working on is a desktop wallet uh, to complement um, the iPhone wallet called Metatron. Uh, we should be releasing that in the next like 30 to 45 days. Um, yeah, and we're putting a big push towards education with eostutorials.com, among other projects that will be released in the next 30 to 45 days. So hopefully you guys will vote for us here in Korea <laughs> and get us into a block production uh, role so we can continue to build tools and add value to the ecosystem. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Excellent. A big round of applause for Tribe. And we're going to welcome Shios on stage. Come on, guys. A round of applause. Hi, my name is Naomi. And I'm Emily. And we are co-founders of Shios. We are proud to be an all-female founded block producer. Our focus is access, empowerment, and education, specifically of women in this space. In this brief amount of time, I want to talk to you about something that is near and dear to our heart, which is the Shios Foundation. We see education as one of the most effective ways to create change. We're passionate about gender parity in tech. For our first community benefit project, the SHIO Foundation will provide tech scholarships to girls grades three through five through Soft Uni in Sofia, Bulgaria. While we were traveling around the world looking for women and educational sites, we started to think, how come our community is not more involved in this? How can we engage the EOS community? And so we were, what we really realized was that um, we, weren't, we didn't need to be the only ones making a decision about this, um, making a decision about where the scholarships goes, making a decision about who is actually getting the scholarships. And so that's why we're going to launch a Shios token. Um, so we're going to airdrop a Shios token to every single EOS holder. Um, and the token will basically allow every single EOS holder to help vote on who, what females are actually getting the scholarships, and then also what schools are, um, are we're going to be using as well. Um, and so we'll be, we're actually going to be announcing that, or we'll be taking a screenshot of the entire, um, of the entire mainnet on 8.18. So August 8th, or sorry, August 8th. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those are the rules of the game, guys. You get 90 seconds. All right, we're going to now welcome Hello Yos. Please give a round of applause for Hello Yos. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. I'm Savvy from Hello Yos, uh, headquartered in Hangzhou, China. Um, ever since the uh, release of BitShares in 2014, we've been uh, operating and maintaining the node servers, uh, following Daniel from BitShares to Steemit and now uh, EOS. Um, 
Uh, we were the earliest one to in introducing eels to Chinese people. Um, uh, uh, we translated the white paper and the guideline of eels and uh, uh, many other articles uh, into Chinese, which, uh, which attracted uh, many uh, uh, crypto enthusiasts and uh, uh, gradually formed our community with more than 50,000 people. Hello Youth uh, team was uh, our uh, huge fans of Daniel Rimmer and uh, we, we strongly advocate the, uh, uh, the free market plan and uh, firmly uphold the one and only Yields mainnet. Ever since uh, earlier this year, we uh, founded a company to corporatize what we do as a qualified BP uh, a block producer uh, facilitating uh, the, the development of yields um, in five main areas. Uh, the technical uh, research and developing uh, node maintenance, Hello Institute, Hello Media, and Hello Club. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Savi. Thank you. And now, all the way from Durban in South Africa, EOS Africa. Good day, everybody. Um, my name is Kosi. I'm from East Africa. Um, our mission is a simple one, but yet can be a very fundamental one. You see, on Ethereum, when it comes to the African continent, there's only less than half of a percent of nodes across the world in Africa. On Bitcoin, it's even worse. What we want to do is to use our block rewards to fund the deployment of a full node of EOSIO into each and every university that is a, a, a computer science department in the continent of Africa. So if we do this, we find that we might actually achieve an EOS full node in the whole of Africa. So our proposition to the community is the funding of a deployment of EOS nodes across the entire continent of Africa. Thank you very much. All right, that was early. Thank you. EOS Fish from Dallas, USA. Uh, my name is Marshall. I'm a co-founder of EOS.Fish. Yes, .Fish is a TLD now. So when people ask, what's your domain? Uh, it's EOS.Fish. Um, I got into crypto in 2010. Uh, most of my partners also, they've run uh, F2 Pool, uh, which has mined over 1 million Bitcoin almost at this point, um, the oldest mining pool. But what we're really focused on is community. Uh, that's how we originally got into crypto in the first place was a community. And that's also what attracted us to EOS. Uh, it's a, as you can see, this is one of the first meetings and I can tell you it's much bigger than the first Bitcoin meeting for sure. Um, so big shout out to Han and, and the guys from Node One here. Um, but our, our very first project where we'll, we'll be releasing in the next 30 days is an IPFS on top of EOS. Um, and then after that, we'll be using that as a data storage for um, some other projects. We have a reputation system coming and also a video game. Um, so the, the, our first project is to build the data storage layer. And then after that, we'll be making projects for our community. Um, so yeah, if you'd like more info, just check it out, eos.fish. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Marshall. Next up is EOS42 from London, UK. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Charles, the co-founder of EOS42. Um, and one of the first things that brought uh, myself and my co-founder to EOS was the ability for existing token holders to lease out some of their CPU and bandwidth to other token holders and um, make interest on, on that um, lease. And we feel that ability to make interest on your EOS will bring um, brand new users to EOS who will then possibly bring more EOS to users because it's a niche thing for, like someone mentioned earlier, it's, it's not greed, but it's the ability to make more money. And slowly they'll find out the amazing features that EOS has and hopefully they'll bring their friends and more developers over to EOS. Um, and I'm happy to announce that our first version of EOS should be available late August, um, early September. 
Um, and I just want to take some time to thank some people who have been working on it. We had Steve from EOS Tribe helping with the front-end design. We had Nathan from Scatter um, helping, um, advising us. Uh, Michael, our uh, main developer, who's doing all the back-end work. And um, all the BPs who've been involved and who've committed to um, fund, fund the project. So thank you very much. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. That was awesome. Next up, Salt Block, transcontinental team. They'll tell you more about where they're from. Thanks a lot. So yeah, we're based in Salt Lake City and in France, because it makes sense, why not? Um, I'm the voice of the group now, but the real genius are Adrian and Marshall. Thing is, they're too shy to speak for themselves, so this is why I'm representing them. But the fact is, they fucking kill my night, snoring for seven hours in a row. So we take my revenge and no like, take the step, Adrian. Show us where do you come from and share the vision, please. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I've got to do it. Uh, like many of you, we got into computing very young, right? Very young, playing video games and looking at the direction of PC gaming and all this type of stuff. So at some point, Marshall and I decided, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could turn that into a career? So we started building a company that built really high-end gaming computers. And this actually lasted for eight years, where we got involved in you know, bare metal server infrastructure for organizations, supporting very large organizations like Blizzard Entertainment and EA, uh, working in, you know, hand in hand with NVIDIA every time they launched a product. And really what drove us here was the community, right? The gaming community. And you know, through that experience, I had the opportunity to go to Burning Man. And there was a completely different idea that was exposed to me there and it broke a lot of barriers. And through this, I began really feeling from my heart and I think our entire team, I speak for all of us, like we, 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 we come from love and you know, this community is probably the, the best thing that's happened to us in a very long time. We just want to be able to support you in any way we can. So we, we want to meet more of you. Please introduce yourselves. We're always nervous, but we're gonna make it work. Thank you, Adrian, thank you. Next up, Yo Shenzhen, come on up. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, guys. I'm Darren, and I'm from US Sunton. So all what we believe in is creating a new world. So if we were to create a new world, what would our ideals be? Basically, what US Sunton believes in is creating a world of fairness. And with this, that is the main thread that has fueled most of our proposals. So today, what we are actually working on mainly is on the US referendum. So what we are trying to do is to create a referendum system that will be weighted so that we could give individuals who represent uh, block producers, who represent a much larger community, a larger weight in the system. At the same time, we are also working alongside with uh, HK EOS uh, on the worker proposal system, but they have been working on it, so we, we hope to contribute to that system as well. On top of that, um, we have always strived for governance. So we have always been putting up a lot of articles. Our, our experts have been putting up articles on the um, on, on the forums, and on top of that, we have always tried to strive for uh, new projects that could involve the community. That's why our uh, CTO was able to get uh, one of the top five producers, uh, content producers within the community forum say, uh, within in April. Yeah, and um, moving ahead, we are also looking towards uh, maybe building an area in uh, on, on uh, IT, IOTs basically, so that we can. Uh, increase the amount of security that is, in, that is actually a, a flaw in IOTs today. So we believe that blockchain will be very useful for that. And we want to call that US home. Yeah, so these are the projects we are looking to towards the future. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have Stardios from Chengdu, home of the panda and the hot pot. Welcome. So, hey guys, nice to come here and uh, meet you guys. Uh, so, I'm Monica from Stardews, and, and our headquarter is based in Chengdu, China. So, basically, we uh, have co built a blockchain uh, technology and research laboratory uh, with uh, University of uh, Electronic Science and Technology of China in April in order to push the development of blockchain industry and especially US ecosystem and uh, uh, cultivate a group of outstanding developers. 
and in also in April, uh, our uh, wallet app, also called Start Use, was released. Uh, it's simple, it's convenient, and it's user friendly. Um, so uh, you can find it from our official website and uh, maybe share with us your feedback if you like. Uh, and also in June, our hardware wallet memory box was released. Uh, it adopts double uh, encryption technology. So uh, even if your uh, if your even if your phone uh, installed with a uh, DAP wallet lost, you could use memory box to uh, recover your assets. So it it could protect your assets in uh, from any kind of attack. Uh, thank you. That's all I I like to share. Thank you, that was awesome. A big round of applause to the BPs who make the EOS mainnet possible. Come on guys, let me hear it. Thank you, thank you. This is applause for yourselves, you know. You deserve it, you've worked hard. All right, the next session, which is sort of continuing this theme, is uh, what does the Korean, Chinese, and Western community want and need? It's a panel. So we're going to give them a few seconds to get set up. Panelists and moderators, you can come on stage whenever you're ready. Come on up, please. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the first panel uh, for this afternoon. And uh, today we're going to talk about what does the Korean, Chinese, and the Western community want or need. And I'm the moderator of this session. My name is Dafeng from EOS Asia. So, before we start, let's go a you know, quick round of introduction. Tell us your name and the BP that you're representing and the country that you're from. Okay. Uh, Jetsen Sprey. Um, I'm from EOS Amsterdam, which is the country the Netherlands. Uh, and as a block producer, we, we are block producing currently number 11. Thank you for all your votes. Um, and we focus on, of course, uh, accountability, security, and uh, compliance, which is my ball game. Cool. Han? Hello, nice to meet you all. My name is Han from US Not One. And um, yeah, we began as a startup, and then our rank ranges from number three to 30 something. So it's kind of a ride. But then we are proud that we are mo one of the most close to the community BP. Yeah, good to see you. Everybody here. No. And thank you to Node One for actually putting this on, right? Uh, my name is Yves Larose. I'm from EOS Nation, and we're based in Canada. We have seven co-founders, and we have one in the US as well. And our focus is on community engagement, so events like these. Hey, everyone. This is Bo from EOS Silicon Valley. And then so uh, we are located at the Silicon Valley. And then so we're actually a pretty diverse team with people from from American, Chinese, and Australian. So I think we're just something in, in between. And then we're, we're, we're um, focusing on bringing the EOS to the, EOS, uh, to the Silicon Valley community. And then we're helping to bring the whole EOS to the, the world, worldwide level. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Ricky from US Canon, a China blog producer. Once blog producer is now in standby. And we are focused on the education, the community, 
and uh, indicate the developer to enlarge our community. Uh, we are very proud of we can enjoy this, this wonderful project. Yes, thank you, everyone. Cool. So as we can see um, on the floor today, we have uh, block producers from all around the world representing different part of the uh, um, token holder community. And so the first question I want to go with uh, um, Ricky from Canon. So how do you stay in touch with your community? Like what are the ways? Um, first uh, of all, uh, basically we, we just uh, for invest our, our group. Well, we have a lot of big holder in our WeChat group. We, uh, we set up a threshold and every member in our WeChat group need uh, 50K EOS, he can join us. Wow. And then uh, we think uh, we have technology, we have community, and we have big holder. So why we not to do a block producer? Then we start to introduce EOS to our community and improve our uh, technology. And uh, we have the channel on a uh, top, top community, a uh, social community. We have uh, 60,000 fans on our account. We, we announce, the, uh, we write the article every day to update the news all over the world, all over the US. And so um, I think uh, we, we are, hope our community can be, uh, can be a DAC, a root DAC company. Every member in our community is, uh, come from different city. We have no company entity. We hope we can um, do this thing. That's yeah. all, 60,000 of a lot of people with a lot of tokens as well. So do you think uh, the, the, the token holders that um, have large you know, amount of EOS think differently than uh, smaller token holders? Uh, yeah, they are very understand the EOS. They are very, uh, they have very, um, very much requirement to know about EOS. They, they check the news every day, talk about the, uh, the everything update. So uh, that's a different thing with a small holder. I see. And I also want to ask Han, you, 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 you talk about that uh, you've been engaging with the local Korean community a lot. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways that you did that? Um, so we are very communicative with local Korean community. Uh, we have five, uh, almost 5,500 uh, 5, Telegram group members and uh, 3,500, uh, almost 4,000, 4, sorry, and 5,000 uh, followers. And then there's lots of, there's, there's whales, and then there's a small, you know, fishes like me. <laughs> and then, as Rick said, their perspective is very different. Whales, one of the fundamental differences is that whales tends to see it very long term. Whale, uh, while uh, the small holders, they're, uh, they cannot endure the price changes. Fluctuations. Yeah, so, so they, get, they are easily uh, affected by FUDs. So we are, the, one of the roles that they find, find in the community is, hey, calm down, calm down. We got to see it in the long term. So that's how we see it. And then as a block producer, what we want to promote is um, actually EOS has a, such a potential uh, with, uh, with this mechanism of staking, I think it is possible to, instead of pump and dump, we can, everybody can just stake to everybody win for the long term game. So I think it is, I approach this game as a movement. So hey, instead about getting influenced by FUD, why don't we just stake for longer? So for now, the staked amount of the EOS tokens about 30%, well, what if, what happens, say, 18, 90% is all staked, right? The prices go automatically, price will go up. So that's, that's what, what you want to create as a you know, block, block producers. Cool. Eve, so I've, I've seen you, you know, flying around doing meetups. Is that how uh, US Nation engage with your community? Uh, yeah, I do fly around quite a bit. Um, so I guess the way it started for EOS Nation is we started our ambassador program. Uh, we started our ambassador program in February, 
And the idea was just to try and find people around the world that were as interested in EOS as we were, and they were just looking to hold meetups and just meet with other people in their local communities. And um, we, we asked people, hey, if, if you want to do something, we'll help you out, we'll give you some material, and uh, we'll, we'll give you the resources that, that you need in order to be able to, uh, educational resources primarily in the beginning, um, in order to be able to hold more meetups. This idea grew really, really quickly, and we now have uh, 13 official ambassadors, and I think we have another 11 or so that are pending. That's really cool. And wow. this is how we keep in touch with the community, because uh, our, our ambassadors are located throughout the world. And the idea is we're able to get a pulse from different areas what's important for them. And so what's, not only is it what's important for uh, large token holders and small token holders, but geo geographically as well, what's important to people in Southeast Asia or Africa is very, very different than what's important to people in China. Can, can you give some examples of that? I'd love to. Uh, the, the, most, the, the biggest thing that we see right now is cost of account creation. Uh, we have a, a significant amount of ambassadors in, in Africa, Nigeria specifically, and a lot of our, our, our community members out there, they don't even have the three EOS to be able to, or at the peak, I guess, the three EOS to be able to create an account. Um, and that was, a, that was a big thing that, that we were hearing from our community. And so our big focus right now, and it, it's always been, we wanna have EOS accessible to as many people as possible. If the idea is to have EOS be adopted uh, by the mainstream community all around the world and to be able to expand it to be the blockchain, you need to give access to everybody. And that's definitely defined what we've been doing in, in, in terms of actions and how we, uh, we, we push forward for the community in terms of what we wanna see as next steps and as, uh, as the issues come about. What is like the distribution of your community? Because uh, like, for example, Canlan's very focused in the Chinese community, no one, uh, the Korean community. And have you seen some of the, uh, what about the distribution of your community? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, through, through our ambassadors, we have, mo I mean, they're throughout the world. They're spread out throughout the world. Um, I don't know exactly where everybody's from, but what we do when we do our, our weekly AMA is I always ask people, where are you from? And people post the, the comment in the, the country of where they're from, similar to what we did with the go, no-go vote. And uh, it's always interesting because we have people from all over uh, that we really didn't expect. So at some point, I remember somebody offered to translate our documents into Serbo-Croatian. Um, like, we, we really didn't expect that we would have that much presence all around the world in areas that were really, really niche markets. Uh, what I was talking about Nigeria earlier, we're able to translate right now documents into four different Nigerian languages, like sub-dialects of. Um, and so we have like a really, really good spread out North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Oceania, we're kind of missing, so if anybody's interesting, uh, interested in. But yeah, no, we, we have kind of a, a really good spread. And a large part of the community is in Korea and is in China. How do you, so when you say you do the AMA um, every single week, how do you deal with like language barrier? Because uh, I, I imagine you won't be able to speak all the languages. No, so the way that we do it is in Discord right now and people write in their questions and um, basically I just answer them. So it's all unscripted, people can ask whatever they want and we do it typically after the BP meetings. So for a while we were doing it twice a week, now we've lowered the BP meetings to once a week. Uh, so we've been doing it at that time and what we do is people either, I always start by giving a summary of what just happened on the call and then depending on the, the, uh, on the AMA discussions, we record it afterwards and if there was something that was interesting, we also translate and we transcribe a lot of the material that we do so that we can reach out to as many people as possible. This is cool. I think this is actually some practice that a lot of BPs can learn from as well. Um, a question to Bo. Um, how do you stay in touch with the um, people in Silicon Valley? What are some of the things that you do? Yep, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, and, and so for us, um, we, are, we are having actually a pretty um, di diverse community as well. So it's not like um, um, both in Silicon Valley, in China, in Australia. So our approach is basically trying to do the combination of um, online and offline together. So in, in speaking of online, so um, it's like um, um, for, um, in Silicon Valley community, we're, we're trying to um, go, going through um, different meetup groups because one of the main focus is actually targeted to the developer community because there, there are tons of 
great engineers are out there, and then we definitely want to attract them to build on EOS. So if they're actually uh, attracted, then many great dApps will be coming out. So what we, what, what we do is actually we um, went to many meetups meet, meet, meet and then hosted many kind of um, developer-focused talks throughout the Silicon Valley area. So that's the kind of on um, the offline approach we, we're, we're trying to do. Just go to as much meeting as possible to evangelize EOS throughout the whole area to, to make people more excited about it. And also with the awesome news that several days ago, Peter Tiao, the big men are coming to investing, I think it's actually a huge confidence boost for us and also the main, uh, all the EOS community. So that we're actually main, mainly trying, we're gradually going the mainstream. And I think that's something really awesome. So, yeah, so that's our kind of our main approach right now. That's cool. Uh, next question is going to be tough. And I'm going to start from yeah. you. Um, you know, when I, when I engage with a lot of token holders and uh, when, we, when I spoke with them about voting and, you know, staking to vote, um, the, 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 usually the, que the first question they ask me is, what is it in it for me, for the token holders? What is the incentive for me to vote? Um, what is your answer? If, you were asked? Well, um, actually, I did, did, I posted a lot about it on Telegram, and, and um, it, it is also about the discussions about whales voting and their, their motives. Um, if, a, if I would have, like, serious money invested in EOS, um, my idea would be that the most important thing would be that EOS as a system and as a currency, not a currency, but as a token, would thrive. You know, would be healthy, would be healthy in the long term. So my answer to any voter uh, has been and will always be, look at, uh, disperse your votes to where you see the greatest possible possibility for a healthy ecosystem. Um, and that's also why, why we, we have reached out uh, to, to the world. We, uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, is a small country. Um, and we feel like we should interact with the voters all over the world. So we translated almost all of our stuff in Chinese and made YouTube films where we present ourselves and EOS as well. Um, we like to see ourselves as an intermediary between you know, put uh, geographically in between the US or, or North America and, and, and Asia, and in the middle is Europe, that's, and in the middle of Europe, that's where we are. Um, so what we try to, 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 to say to the, to the community and to the world and to the voters is that we're doing a global program, um, and we should try and learn from each other as much as possible. What about smaller token holders? Because wh big whales, I can see that yeah. they can see things in more long term. Well, uh, smaller token holders, uh, they should vote for EOS Amsterdam because Amsterdam is such a nice city. Now, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm half joking. I mean, it's, I, I think if you, if you uh, like myself, I'm a very small token holder. Um, if you have to do, of course, I, I do my research, but if you have to do your research, if you don't have the time and energy to check out every uh, block producer, obviously, you know, there's no way of knowing what to follow or what, what to vote for. So um, I think they can allow a little frivolism, you know? They don't have to be that serious about Ricky it. Ricky wanted to comment on it. Uh, okay, uh, uh, this question is, uh, uh, I be asked in our community very frequently uh, because they are big holder. They, they maybe need a reward. Why? Uh, basically, we do some action to uh, uh, reply this question. We uh, do very more interview for overseas uh, block producers because we want to introduce the good block producer to China community to make make them know about the uh, whole world uh, community. And because they are the uh, stakeholder of the US because they hold a lot of US token, and they, they need the uh, response for, for their token to vote for the right block producers. So we make them uh, how to choose the block producer. 
that's what we do. And, and we often set up the meetup between Western and Eastern. It's to reduce some the, the misunderstanding, right? That's cool. Yeah. Han, do you get that question from the Korean community? Uh, so, okay, so big, so let me just talk, instead of talk about two most biggest questions that I get. So yeah. we do surveys a lot, and then instantly, when you throw a Google survey, we get like a two, three thousand, uh, two, three hundred responses in just 30, 15 minutes. And then there's two biggest uh, requests that you see from the community. The biggest one is a stake. What's the return? What's my return yeah. for staking? The second thing is um, uh, I lost my private key. <laughs> I lost my, <laughs> do something. <laughs> That's the thing. So uh, we are, as a block producers, we, we, are, we are having lots of conversation on that. And then, so for uh, the staking part, so I think uh, what you can do is that, you know, giving a kickback, direct EOS kickback, it's not possible, it's impossible, it's a direct, uh, outright illegal, right? So what I think instead we can do is, uh, you know, there's lots of BPs that wants to accelerate dApps, right? So instead of giving uh, EOS tokens, we can uh, issue, uh, let dApps that you incubate, let them issue tokens, and then give more tokens to those who stakes than just uh, speculators. In that way, we can further align the interest of everybody. So you mean targeted air airdrop to the, to the voters? Uh, you could say voters, or you can change the word like stake, stakes, those who stakes, yeah. Gotcha. Mm. This is actually an interesting idea. I mean, I, I think uh, we're getting to uh, questions where people ask, what is the incentive for me to vote? What is the incentive for me to stake? And I want to hear more creative solutions. So Han mentioned about airdropping to people who, just, who, who stake. Is there any other idea that you uh, thought of? One other thing that I want to add is we see that so those, it's really important to cast as many votes as possible. Yeah. So in the beginning, I thought is, oh, why, why, why do we have a 30 votes per token? It's insane. It's only gonna increase the whale's power, right? But then it's not. It's actually spreading, spreading. So I think we can, all of us, all BPs, we can promote those whale token holders. Hey, cast as many votes as possible. In that way, we can uh, objectively uh, see, like, you know, those, who, those VPs who make lots of value, who get recognized, they're gonna be automatically th high in the top. So I think in that way, we can just, you know, cast as many votes as possible, and then we VPs accelerate, and then their depths, each tokens, we can mix two ways to make the whole ecosystem healthier. That's cool. Eve, you wanted to add something to incentivize people? Yeah, I, ju I just thought about the, the staking portion. Uh, feel free to steal this idea because I'm not going to do it. Um, for small token holders, one of the things that could be interesting is you get a, a badge. And because we're on, uh, somebody was mentioning CryptoKitties earlier and collectibles, what if you had a badge that for every day or for every block that you, you were staking your tokens for, it would increase, 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 and at some point, the badge would, could be worth something because I've staked for 737 days in a row without unstaking kind of deal. That's a very cool idea. If there's an app developer out there, this is actually a very interesting idea to take on. Yeah, and I would like to um, add one more thing about that that Han just ma mentioned. Han said, um, so our, our RBPs should kind of evangelize and um, just to ally the community to vote as much BB as possible. That's definitely true. And also on the other side, essentially I think uh, BBPs can also make more conscientious efforts to to encourage and, and, and to and to go to the community that, that, that they're not very familiar with. I think one example action I can give actually from Han because I met Han in San Francisco, and then so he uh, and then he told me that he basically have known personally of almost every BP in the world. I I asked him how. He told me he, he told me he basically he flew uh, flew to every possible big conference throughout the world to meet as many BP as possible. I think that's a kind of um, a step going out of your comfort zone to kind of um, get to know more because you know we have such a, a d different um, 
differences in geographical, cultural, or even political. But if we can actually, and I do observe that many, many PPs are trying their best to, you know, we're, we're all here in Korea, and then we maybe we're in Shanghai, we'll be in the United States, we'll be in U Europe. So as, as more, more BPs kind of um, paying conscious effort in, in going, to the, go, go, going to the culture or areas they're not familiar with, and then telling them as much English as possible would be really helpful to, to help the token holders to vote as many BP as possible. Yeah. Awesome. So the, this question, I actually wanted to leave it to you guys to pick from another um, BP that you want to ask about their audience, their token holders, their community. What is one question you want to ask about them? What is one thing that you want to learn from them? Um, yeah, what, what, I, what I want... Pick, like, pick one first. Pick one. Yeah. Um, okay, Han, sitting next to me. We know each other. Um, what, I, what I want to, to, to know and what, what my big question has been for, for a while is how we can enlarge our community. Because we're talking about token holders, that those are people that are already in, they, they, they have something at stake, excuse my language, but how do we get ordinary people, ordinary business into EOS? Ordinary people are ah, extending, extending the outreach. Specifically to Korean um, um, community or? Worldwide. Okay, okay. I mean, I, I mean, it's pretty simple because it takes money to create a new account. So actually, I see, you know, in Korea, we are just beginning a service where we use using up our tokens to help those new token holders to create their account. And then I see there's lots of BPs doing the same thing. So I think it, it can be a good initiative. And then one thing is that, I, one thing really, I, I really wanted to say here is that Korean voters are losing their interest. You know, Korea is a big market. Korea has a 30, 40% of the, all the transactions here. And then Korean block producers, eight, you see there, there's eight. And then we are not on top 21. So guys, please help, we are losing interest here. You know what I mean? So please. <laughs> Why do you think that might be the case? Huh? Let's dive into that a little bit more. Why do you think that might be the case? Um, I don't know. It's, it's okay. So, so, take a look. Uh, soccer. Soccer. World Cup. World right? Cup. <laughs> it's a World Cup. <laughs> if your country is a top 16, it's fun, right? Yeah. We just actually, uh, Yetze just you know, tweeted like uh, three weeks ago, hey, Han, hey, I ho really hope Korea wins against Germany. But then we are already losing hope. Oh, yeah, yeah, we already lose because we we even if we, we even if we win against Germany, we already cannot get into top 16. But then it, we won against Germany. Korea winning against Germany is impossible. 2-2-0. Two, two, oh. and then people go crazy. So that's how you you know where you put attention. It's only fun when you you know kind of have this winning feeling. Right? So that's it. <laughs> yeah, so I actually have a question to both Eve and Ricky. Because I consider um, EOS Nation and EOS Canon are good to representative of a loosely coupled community and a very tight knit community. Because I'm so, so these are the two main types of community right here. So I'm wondering, guys. Um, What's your experience in building a tightly coupled community and a loosely widely spread community, and then how, how, how the experience can be shared with fellow BPs, how to achieve that? I guess for us, because it's such a, a, a community that's spread out, a big part of, of what we need to do is empower them. So we empower our ambassadors, we empower our community, uh, and, and that's really specific to each different person and to each different region. Uh, so what one, like I was saying earlier, what one person needs is very different than somebody else. Um, and so our main role is to keep them involved. And so it links to this as well. How do you keep people involved? Um, and so through social media for us is, is one big thing. And another reason why I'm on the pl in the plane all the time and why our ambassadors are, are sorry, why our co-founders are in planes all the time. We've hosted over 50, minutes, 50 meetups worldwide at this point. And that's how we get the pulse from people. Um, and so be accessible, empower them, and uh, continue the education, give them access. Thanks. Uh, for, for Canon, and, uh, 
we uh, not not only the big holder group, we also have the small holder groups. Uh, we hope to enlarge our community to outside outside the big holders uh, because it, it's the future of the community, right? So uh, s uh, another uh, we can make the community very tight because everyone everyone wants to join join our uh, co uh, the trace holder uh, group. Uh, everyone I will add the WeChat contact one by one. So we. We always talk each other uh, privately, and they have questions they can ask me directly, uh, both in technical side uh, or the community side. So maybe it's a Chinese culture. They like to, and they good at to make friends. <laughs> they they like to social together. Yeah, I think that that's why um, Chinese community community size is so large. Thank you. And also, I would like to ask a question about your Dafeng and the rest of us as well, because we are, well, because for us, uh, cause because our location, we're thinking about building a, a developer community as well, because from the various communication with the developers across the world, there, there, there's actually one thing that really struck me is that they're actually trying to find a place to, uh, to let the developers to help each other, because, you know, like, and as James just mentioned, that there's documentation, they're not fully documented, and also there's various issues in development, so we're actually trying to build this community to help developers to help each other. So I'm wondering, do you have any ideas or suggestions to how we can kind of enable the developer community to help each other? Yeah, um, so at EOS Asia, um, we actually have like a developer group, a WeChat group, that uh, we talk a lot about any updates that get released by Block One, as well as answering questions from developers uh, that they have faced. and. Uh, for, for, and from there, we also have seen you know, awesome projects, awesome developers, and we get more hands-on helping them. Um, um, and you know, I actually think that the block producers are the, are the first group of people that the developers will ask help from. They think that you know, we're definitely more technically savvy, we know how uh, EOS work, and uh, you know, as EOS Asia, we often get very hands-on helping them. And, uh, for awesome projects, we actually go and incubate them as well. Um, I think uh, there's also a you know, multitude of problems that developers right now face. Han mentioned something about RAM costs, creating account costs. We've seen like um, awesome projects that, that's porting um, hundreds of thousands of users from their, you know, their, their, their internet, you know, SaaS-based company uh, to blockchain and found that this is a huge cost for them, so we're exploring other solutions for them as well. Things like the you know, side chain, things as the um, solutions on the RAM. Um, there's there's also um, they they also don't have like a very stable test net that they can deploy things to. So we're working with some of the Chinese VPs to set up a, a stable test net that replicates a production environment for them to deploy their smart contract before they go live. So those are the things that we're doing as, um, as you know, EOS Asia. Thanks. What about other people? Uh, okay, I, ha I have a question. Because China is a big market, and uh, both on the token holder and uh, the, the uh, people in China who like EOS. Uh, because this, uh, everyone, every VP has the requirement to to in uh, to operator in China. So, what uh, US Canon can can do for you in China? Yeah. Help us. And <laughs> okay, that was obvious, right? Now, I think we need to understand the Chinese issues. Um, I've come aboard EOS Amsterdam because of the legal my legal background. So. What we try and establish is a compliant blockchain, but it's in Europe, it's, so it's European-based. Um, we, we, what we would like to know from the Chinese, if we ex, you know, reach out to them, is what are the, is, are there any regulatory stuff? Is there regulatory stuff out there? Uh, how do we uh, encourage our community, small community, but internationally orientated, 
to build apps that will actually resonate in China? How could we arrange for that communication? And we, we, have, we have already Chinese, uh, yeah, I would say, ambassadors and Korean ambassadors as well. So, you know, we're trying to establish that. Um, but, but that's it, you know, it's, it's what do you guys want? And in, in exchange for that, you know, we can tell you what, I mean, the European Union is, is a very, is a, a huge market, you know, it's very interesting, but they are not as crypto minded as they should be or could be. So there's a lot, very, very much to gain there. And as, as a return favor, you know, we're very looking forward to, to helping you to, to, to get stuff working in Europe as well, you know, and enlarge your market considerably. Okay, so time is up, and I want to continue this discussion among the block producers um, after the panel. And let's give a round of applause to the five block producers <laughs> from all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much for that discussion, Dafang. That was amazing. Thank you. All right, so uh, next up, we have a, a very interesting discussion that's coming up on the mainnet infrastructure and security. So this, must, this will be pretty exciting to all the developers in the house. So if you are a technology specialist, a developer, a product architect, uh, infrastructure engineer, why don't you just stand up for a second? We would like to thank you for the work that you guys do, me included. So let's give a round of applause to all the developers or technology specialists. Come on, stand up. Stand up. I see you guys. Where is uh, Michael Yates? Stand up. Stand up. Stand up, please. Yes. There, there are a lot of people here. Where is uh, Winlin? Why is Winlin sitting down? Yos Lao Mao. I see you on the call. Stand up. Stand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the hard work. All right. So we have a few minutes break uh, for bathroom, stretch your legs, whatever. So precisely in 10 minutes from now, so it's actually 2.30 right now, we're going to start at 2.40, the next panel. So please go ahead, take a break, come back in. We're going to get started with the infrastructure panel. Thank you. Yeah, your mics are on your chair. All righty, I turn you over to your moderator, Matthias Romeo. A big round of applause. Please welcome the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to, to thank um, the guys from Node One, Han and Saltosh, for having us, for having this oh. great conference. Um, Okay, this is the panel for infrastructure and security. Um, maybe we can introduce yourself a little bit of introduction for people that don't know you in the live stream. So maybe Richard, you can start. Sure, thank, thanks Matthias. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Richard Reiner. Um, I'm chairman of EOS Canada. You might ask what is the chairman doing sitting here on a security and infrastructure panel? Um, I, I come from that world. I, I have over the last 20 years, I have built and sold, depending on how you count, three or four or maybe five uh, cybersecurity companies. Hey everyone, I'm Igor, uh, head of technology from US Rio. We come from Brazil. We our goal is primarily with infrastructure and security of the network and enhancing EOS to the maximum. So uh, just to add to that, you all should know that that everybody who's doing BP technology stuff, when we have questions that we can't answer, the guy we go to is Igor. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Eric from EOS Southwest of Eden, or EOS Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had our name stolen, so we had to change it, basically. Yeah. Uh, more about that later, so maybe. Anyways, uh, I am the CTO and co-founder, and um, also a part of the, uh, the Ghostbusters infra infrastructure and security team with Igor. Yeah. Eugene Luzgin, I'm a technical founder of EOS Tribe. 
uh, have about 20 years of software development and I have built an um, architecture systems for banks, including Federal Reserve Bank, uh, specifically around security. And I'm also a member of um, Ghostbusters core team um, and this group basically, and we worked on security standards for years, uh, block producer infrastructure. Uh, John Milburn, I'm Jem on Telegram. Uh, I've been doing security and internet infrastructure things for about 40 years, uh, built a lot of the broadband internet and commercial services here in Korea. Okay, good guys, thanks for the introduction. And to start with, uh, maybe with Jem, and what are the security responsibilities of a block producer, and how, how do you see this? Right. So first, I'm not a block producer, everyone else here is. Uh, uh, I've been uh, engaging with and helping, you know, lots of block producers, uh, anybody who asks questions. Uh, but the security responsibilities, very simply, are, you know, stay up, stay producing. The, the job is really simple, is, you know, make sure that you are as immune to attack and as immune to failure as possible. Richard, do you agree with that? I, I, I agree with that, John, but I mean, I, I, I'd go further. I, I see the block producers as the organizations more than any others that are responsible for the continuous and the correct operation of EOS as a platform. Um, and that gives you a set of responsibilities that are very similar to those that any organization that's running some other kind of critical infrastructure, uh, w whether that's a control system for a power plant or whether that's a banking network or, or whatever that is, uh, would have. So that's a pretty broad and, and robust set of security mandates that you've got to fulfill. Uh, you've got to think about it in terms of uh, personnel security. You know, each and every person who has access to infrastructure or to keys how much do you know about them? Have you checked the backgrounds? Do you know they don't have a history with organized crime or, or whatever it might be? Uh, you've got to think about it in terms of uh, processes and procedures. How do you generate keys? You know, the wrong way would be to generate keys on board somebody's personal laptop, which has some percentage chance, maybe large, maybe small, of already being subverted. And so those keys are not under your control from day zero. It, it, it goes on. You've got to think about physical security. You've got to think about network security. You've got to think about application level security. It's a it's a big responsibility. And w without having um, uh, those issues addressed, what do you think are the the, the, the main threats for the whole network uh, in case of a security breach on the on a majority of block producers? Do you think that we can get to a point where the network could be stopped, or what's the worst? Scenario? Scenario that you can imagine. Oh, yes. Question for me. Okay. Um, okay. So, I think an, an awful lot of, of good quality thinking has been invested in uh, in in considering network and server level and network architecture and, and things like that. The things that concern me the most would be, you see, so, so that that's an area where we amongst block producers we have a high level of diversity. The heterogeneity helps us. We're running in all kinds of different ways. We are not identical. We are identical at the software layer, at the application layer. That is a monoculture. We, all, we are all running more or less the same applications. And so if there were to be, the, the most devastating situation would be if there were a scalable attack. If there's an attack that somehow subverts every block producer's operations, and the only way really you could do that would be with a, an application layer attack. If there is some rogue transaction that everybody signs off on, because it's uh, the result of something incorrect in ODIOS. I mean, that's that's the worst case scenario, right? Okay. Igor? So yeah, vulnerability on the smart contract level would be the, the worst thing for now. So we, we can't do much to protect for that except for testing and testing every day, every single thing we can. So we have been uh, working, building tools to, to be able to test. Like uh, we have a secondary test net running on different machines with those guys participating also. And there we can modify the software to test it as much as possible. And this stuff is yeah. not theoretical. There are a couple of such bugs, such attacks that exist right now today and we're waiting for patches for those. And so we've, yeah, the, the, well the thing is that situation exists fairly frequently. That, 
we play around with it. We find something doesn't look right, investigate, find the bug. We have to responsibly disclose it to block one and get those patches done. So there, yeah, there are, there are you know, two outstanding cases like that now mm -hmm. that I see. will be resolved pretty soon. You know, I would like to add to John's point. EOS, you know, it's a blockchain, but it's still a software. And all the rules of deploying secure software, uh, you know, still apply. And so we could uh, learn from industry experience. And, you know, I have deployed systems for Federal Reserve Bank, which are much less critical, in my opinion, than EOS, which went through rigorous uh, security testing and extra precautions taken at infrastructure level. And so we were trying to apply the same principles here for EOS, you know, infrastructure and security best practices. To secure software, you always assume the software is not secure. There are always security holes in any software. So you try to shield it from outside access by extra layers of security. That's just the best practice. And some of this is pretty hard to deal with because we've got a software supplier who basically believes in testing everything on the live network. And so, so, so just to mitigate that, to mitigate also the speed at which the stuff comes out, we've implemented, we've got the jungle test network. Yep. That is, you know, invaluable for checking the stability and usability of a lot of the features. But we've also now developed our test cave network where we can very rapidly run through all the suites of tests. We've got, you know, over a hundred tests that we do on that fully automated in, you know, less than 15 minutes mm -hmm. for any new release. And we're, we're, we're launching now a performance test network where we can tweak and adjust various parameters of the hardware and the software config uh, uh, to, to look at corner cases. Great, awesome. And speaking of that, um, are, are there any things that we can learn from operational experience of other type of systems of critical infrastructure, like uh, sensitive ICS systems or global financial networks? Richard, I don't know if uh, you can. So the, I guess the question is, um, what can we learn from the way that other kinds of critical infrastructures right. run? I mean, I think a lot, honestly. Um, you know, to, to, to run a, a, a block producer at the highest standard is a, is a challenging undertaking. You have, you know, where you've, got, you've got objectives with respect to confidentiality and integrity and availability, and you have to have a systematic planning and thought process. You've, you've got to have done the threat modeling. I think that's key. If you don't start by thinking like an attacker, if you don't make a concerted and serious effort to identify every possible way in which the system could be attacked, in which every way in which your confidentiality objectives could be compromised, so the things that should be secret don't stay secret, or ways in which your integrity objectives could be compromised, things that shouldn't be tampered with get tampered with without authorization. And, and your availability objectives, you know, things that should be working, stop working. If you, if you don't bother to model that out in the beginning, then you're building controls in a vacuum. Then you're trying to solve problems without understanding them first. So uh, probably that, I think that, that if I had to identify one thing, it would be you can't do effective security in an operational context like this without starting with making a big investment in building the threat models. Folks agree? Eric? I would like to add to that. Um, of course, part of the software we are running is the EOS IO software, but that of course comes with running Linux systems. And we are, most of us are using proxies to go into the system and all of those kind of things. So we can of course base our best practices on best practices from other uh, systems running on those softwares as well. I got, yeah, from, I don't know if you are familiar familiar with, but we, we have been advocating with a type of infrastructure setup that EOS is just, a, the, the Node EOS software, EOS IO, is just a small part of it because the producer run the EOS IO software on the, the, the first layer, and we have other layers on top to protect the producer with full nodes that, that broadcast blocks to, the, to the, all of the network. And uh, beyond that, we, we have the API nodes that not, all, not are always running 
uh, Node.js because uh, now we are using Elasticsearch to improve the API responsiveness instead of using Node.js and that's at another, uh, not security, but another concern layer also. So we have to, to, to watch the whole picture to, to see where the threads can, where the threads are. And of course, some of these software um, are only there to add to the security and others are there to add to the uptime that we can provide. So if we add proxies in front of our full nodes, for example, then we can easily take down our full nodes without anything happening to the access to our network. So one, uh, one very specific point I would like to bring up is that Node.js running as a full node has a web server built into it. You can run and accept public connections right into that box. Anybody who's running that is a fool. The, the, you, you, know, you should not expose this type of brand new untested software to public access. The potential for uh, uh, security problems or uh, service disruption problems is just way too high. Any full node access should absolutely be proxied by something in front of it that is much more well-known, stable, and uh, certified. Yeah. Also, if we do that, of course, we can decide if we find a critical issue with some specific call or anything, then we can decide to filter that traffic without modifying the software running in yeah, that's behind. Easy. And also to add the, the, for us, for instance, we are not using HTTPS inside Node.js anymore because it's not reliable, that reliable, and, and breaks performance. So we decided to, to use EOSIO with HTTP only and uh, use the proxy to to provide the secure connection. All good. I would like to add also, you know, nodes that you see on a EOS monitor page, for example, those are full nodes. You don't see production nodes. Production nodes are actually hidden. Most of us are running on a WireGuard private network where all connections are, you know, encrypted and point to point between those producing nodes. And there is no access actually to pro produce a node, right? Uh, so it's running on a private network. It's only, it only has access to a synchronized full nodes that it gets blockchain uh, you know, synchronization from. That actually brings up uh, a point. We've seen a lot of uh, media or some uh, external surveys who have, you know, tried to look at these uh, block producers and, and we see crazy headlines like, Everybody's running on AWS and Google Cloud. All, and there's no bare metal block producers. Well, that means that the people doing the measurement don't know what the hell they're doing. Uh, basically, all of us, all of them, are using these web proxies out there, using those cloud services, using other types of services as a way to DDoS protect them or make that easy. The real nodes are actually hidden. Anybody running bare metal is running them in a very hidden way so that you from the public cannot ever know mm -hmm. what the actual IP address is, where those physical servers are. That is a proper design. And so anybody doing such a measurement based on the, the, the public access you know, API nodes is always going to see nothing but the proxies. If you can actually see the real production servers, that's a BP that you want to vote down. Here, here. And just to add to that one more, um, some of us are running even the, uh, the proxies on bare metal and others are not. And that's also good for diversity in my opinion. So it's very important that we don't all go down the same, same route, I think. Uh, the more we can diversify the network, the better it is. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, I have another question here. Um, what did you see as the most significant unsolved problems or the biggest current threats in the security of the EOS system right now? One of the unsolved problems I've been seeing, like re recently we have been seeing those huge transaction counts because of uh, testing, most, most for, for now. Uh, and with that, we noticed that latency between the block transmission on the, the, the block producers around the world ha are not uh, uniform and they are uh, varying a lot. So 
One thing that, because right now the schedule is just set in alphabetical order between the producers that are voted on the top 21, and we need some tools to, to fix this and to, uh, to actually optimize the schedule uh, to make it uh, faster to move the blocks around. So on that side, we are preparing a tool that we plan to uh, make it public and allow every producer to publish uh, their logs to us. Um, so this is, will be called Hyperion. Uh, Hyperion will be able to collect logs from everyone. And it works in several fronts, but one of the fronts is to build uh, optimized schedule uh, from uh, up position, like an overview from the blockchain. And with that, we'll be able to, uh, for instance, Hyperion should be able to publish a transaction on the blockchain uh, once we have some scheduling tool in, 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 uh, in the contract. Uh, and this transaction, will, this, this proposal, can be signed by the producers to re replace the, actual, the, the current schedule with a better schedule that will make the transactions run faster. Because those uh, those uh, latency, they can uh, create forks, like the not forks of use, but uh, micro the forks of the micro chain, forks. micro forks, and uh, and this uh, breaks the performance and uh, cancels some transactions. And so let me expand on that a little bit and simplify it for the the, the less technical folks, because. The last few days with these very high transaction volumes, we have seen a shitload of these microforks he's talking about. The, the, it's coming from uh, the higher latency that we get when we're, we're uh, uh, seeing these high transaction rates. There are a couple of factors. The, the factor that we're talking about to try and solve with Hyperion is it's what's called the schedule. We have 21 block producers and in the system automatically we set a schedule which is the order in which they will produce blocks. That schedule right now is done just purely randomized. No, alphabetical. Yeah, it's just alphabetical. Yeah. So, so what we want to do with the Hyperion project is get from each active block producer, get his view of the latency to all the other producers this is a huge meshing problem, right? Because you've got, you've got 21, each is connected to 20, so you've got a 20 factorial uh, data set issue there. Yeah, and the longer term solution that we're working on is the Hyperion, but we also made some shards where we basically Definitely. entered our nodes and pinged around to other nodes to make sure how we could optimize the schedule. So we actually have some shards where a lot of us have been involved and um, yeah, if we have a solution on the contract to, to if block one provides something for us to change the schedule manually with a proposal from a Mootsig proposal, we can just push our manual solution and I think we'll, we'll see great improvement in the transaction performance. So uh, another big factor in this micro forking problem we've seen in the last week or so is how EPs talk to each other. We've got a number of cases where a BP will have a producer node here, they'll have a full node here, the other BP has a producer node which is connected to his full node. And the way they talk to each other is a P2P or Bnet connection between their full nodes. Well, when we get these very high transaction rates coming in, the full nodes run a whole lot slower than the producer nodes do. They introduce latency so that getting a, getting a block from producer A to producer B, if it has to traverse two full nodes, you're introducing a whole lot of extra latency. And we're seeing in some cases blocks are being held up. They're coming in you know, 10, 15 seconds later. We're, and, and, and every one of those is a disruption and, and something that has to be recovered. Let me just add that the software actually managed these mini forks very well. I'm yeah. really impressed by the improvements in the, in the Nodeo software. Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. None of this has been a problem so far because the recovery has worked beautifully. But what we want to do is encourage block producers to get more direct connections between the producer nodes, reduce the latency, reduce the variable latency that's introduced by running the, the flood through the API nodes. And we've got a number of techniques where 
two producers can connect to each other and never expose their private addresses. So, so the, the, anyone who's interested in doing that, contact one of these guys and we can uh, uh, help set it up. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I just wanted to highlight, I mean, uh, a, a different problem, totally unrelated to that one, but with some similar root causes, which are that we are running a, a very new software stack here. So uh, let me talk, let's talk about out-of-band signing for a minute. So in the, in the default configuration, Nodios is this monolithic thing, and signing happens, which means that private keys have to be accessible within this monolithic piece of software. So Block1 did something we think is very clever. They gave us this out-of-band signing mechanism so you can farm out the signing process to a separate process that can run in a separate address space. It can be in a different container. It can be in a different server. Unfortunately, the out-of-band signer that they gave us still requires you to have a private key sitting on disk. So we've actually done something that we, we've open sourced that's available to every block producer who wants it. We've built a different out-of-band signer, one which does not require a private key to be stored in a disk file any place. So you can avoid having any private keys stored on any server in your entire block producer infrastructure, which that seems like a win. Oh, that's awesome. Good. Okay, and uh, let me sh just ask about Hyper Hyperion, how's the name? Hyperion. Uh, Hyperion. Yep. So you, you are trying to do it on chain so that it block producers will publish the latency between. Mm. No, it's a little more complex than that. So okay. um, it's Elastic cl Cluster, so it's distributed around the world, and um, every producer will ha receive a certificate, okay. assign a TLS certificate to, for emitted from us, so we can, we can uh, actually know that is a real producer, not okay. anyone that just got access to the API and is publishing fake logs, okay. right? So this is one part, the log publishing from the producer, and the, the software that uh, publishes the log will actually hide the IP address, so we don't know uh, uh, the IP of the producer node, that's fine. Um, and the other part is the, the collection of the whole blockchain. So Epirin right now has the complete EOS blockchain indexed in Elasticsearch. So we can provide full analytics about everything that happens in EOS. So if you want to see data from any DAP, we can just give in, in a couple milliseconds. Okay. So, uh, it, and this enables us to, to do things that the, the usual APIs that Node EOS provides don't allow us to do fast. Mm -hmm. And it, it will consume resources from the, from the actual node. So instead of consuming resources from the node, we, we use the query services from Elasticsearch uh, to push, uh, to provide data for anyone that will be able to do it. So and these are the two parts. And when this is ready and running, we'll be able to provide more. So we can do alerts for the producers. Mm -hmm. And uh, since machine learning is coming to, the, to this, this uh, software also, uh, we'll be able to predict some patterns that may, may, uh, may bring nodes to, to crash. So okay. if we see in the past a node crashing uh, due to, to latency issues or some exceptions that appear on the, on the logs, we might, we might just uh, send alerts to that producer, say, hey, your node is, has, has a high probability of cr crashing today, so something like okay, that. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, talking about that, uh, what cross block producer system and processes uh, do we need um, that we currently lack? That maybe um, what you were talking, it's related to that. Like, uh, should we have a shar shared operational dashboard for early detection of issues and tracks? Uh, a more robust incident response plan? Hell yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this idea came after a disaster response um, planning that Thomas Cox did with the, the producer, and we got the, the role of being uh, responsible for monitoring, and then we, we came to the, the, the idea of building this as a platform for the whole community, so it should be serving that purpose. Right. Well, 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 and just question everybody else on that, like what, what about incident response? I mean, do you guys feel that we have today among block producers a sufficiently robust incident response process. We can communicate with each other effectively. We can coordinate our efforts if those fits the fan. Are we good enough at that yet, or do we need to get better? I think I feel like we are evolving 
right? We are still in the early stages. There's still a lot of improvements that we can do. Again, learning from industry, for example, uh, doing a shared log across active block producers and having a common place to go to monitor for errors across all 21, uh, something like Splunk or you know, using other tools would be a great uh, addition you know, and keeping operations stable. One, one thing that's problematic about that is, is comes up clearly. I'd say until about 12 days ago, the top 21 had changed every day. There, there, there had been no, you know, very consistent set of 21. There, the, the, almost everyone who's in the top 21 now has been in or out over time. Uh, about 12 days ago, it kind of stabilized until Monday this week, and then it started shaking up again. Uh, but the point is, you can't, you can't have a process that just has some set and say, okay, we know who they are. The, the, and the way to evolve a process where sort of the, the responsible ones change dynamically on any whim is really hard to establish. And we've seen it in the, you know, just sort of the, nonsense bitching back and forth about who gets to be in the calls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, could one, I, I, one idea we've kind of... Could, could I just add? Could I add something to this? Thank you. So during the night, we actually had um, some big accounts hacked. So a lot of EOS was stolen tonight. And um, so I stayed up for a few hours yesterday and continued this morning. So we have been in communication with all of the block producers within only a few hours. And we actually managed to, uh, I think, everyone has confirmed at least, to stop that attack now. So um, I think we are getting to a point where we have better access to all of the block producers. And this is even during a conference. So, so it's, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it was one and a half million dollars that we stopped tonight, yeah. I would agree with the perspective that we're getting better. I, I think there's still some ways to go there. If we're talking about benchmarking ourselves against the kinds of organizations that are the best in the world at this, I think we have some ways still to go. Yeah, big time. There's a, there's a lot of progress to be made here. It's the, the, the encouraging thing is that, that we're continuously getting better. And, and, you know, and we're in the midst here of an incredibly messy bootstrapping of governance. And, uh, uh, you know, the block producers are sort of the stable linchpin of this right now. But, you know, there's also the ongoing fear of too much power there. So everybody's treading very carefully. Nobody wants to establish, you know, uh, too, too strong a centralized organization that will, uh, you know, then be a magnet for more criticism. So, so, so developing this as a distributed system is really a new kind of event. So I'm, I'm encouraged that it's getting better. That, and right, this incident this morning was just lovely. It, it, it got done nice and quiet with the right connections to the right people. And, and, and it happened. And, and we're, you know, we're still locked into this tough situation where blacklisting still takes all 21. And, you know, it, we're not to the point where we can do a 15, a 21 multi-sig on it. And we're also working on that part. Yeah, of course. I mean, a, a, a related idea that we've just kind of started thinking about and haven't, re haven't really reached any conclusions on is it may be possible to have some kind of a dynamic permissioning system for who gets notified and who does that is driven by smart contracts on chain. Yep. Right? And obviously, we'd have to collaborate if we wanted to build a thing. Yeah, that's, it's definitely the goal to get there. But sort of, in some sense, a lot of these things also need sort of our referendum ability to be in place to, you know, sort of toss out some of the structural changes we might, might want to make where it's sometimes better done by a community approval than just a, a, a decision amongst BPs. So, you know, there's... Some, some are okay here, some really should be here, but we don't have that second option yet. So uh, again, there are a lot of gating factors in this bootstrap, so, uh, but stuff's developing. It's all real positive. Well, well okay guys, we are running out of time. Um, maybe 
if you have some no, other things. No, there's one more thing. One more thing, yeah. Jane, please. Matthias, you forgot to introduce yourself at the ah, beginning. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, well, my name is Matias Romeo. I'm from EOS Argentina. I just joined last week. I have been working for Block One Developing EOS for a year. And well, this is my first time as a moderator. So it's been a pleasure being with you guys and with the audience also. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Uh, Well, guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was excellent discussion. Thank you, Jem. Thank you, Eugene, Igor, Richard, and Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. That was excellent discussion. Thank you. We learned to a lot of new ideas that are being worked on right now. That's fantastic. Thank you. We're going to do a quick uh, change here of the stage setting. The next. Uh, uh, the next item on the agenda is a short presentation by Dr. Sungil Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim is, the co is a co-founder of EOS Node 1, and uh, he's going to be talking about an alternative solution for the RAM squatting problem. Uh, we're all excited about the current price of RAM on the EOS network, and we're going to hear a few ideas on that from Dr. Sungil Kim. Please welcome Dr. Sungil Kim. And while he's on stage, I just wanted to mention that this particular presentation will be in Korean. Uh, if you want the real-time translation, please wear your hear ed uh, sorry your headsets. And channel two is for English. Channel three will be for Chinese. So, please once again welcome Dr. Sangil Kim. Thank you. Anyosa 우리가 신혼 기간을 거칠 때는 좀 이제 연인 부부 사이에 서로를 좀더 알아가는 시간이기도 하고 또 어떻게 보면은 또 그것이 갈증을 유발하기도 합니다. 어, EOS는 대 플랫폼인데 대 플랫폼에서 이램 아, 가격은 아, 지금 많은 갈등을 지금 발생시키고 있습니다. 마치 이게 메인넷 런칭하고 신혼 기간 같이 지금 램 가격으로 인해서 많은 문제점을 발생시키고 있습니다. 아 이것은 램 스코팅 문제를 아주 잘 보여주는 차트입니다. 이것은 램 마켓에서 램 가격의 추이를 보여주는 것입니다. 여기에서는 세 가지를 우리가 확인을 문제점을 확인을 할수 있습니다. 첫 번째는 램 가격이 굉장한 변동성이 있다는 것입니다. 아, 초기 가격 대비 피크 가격이 55배 올랐습니다. 와우. 안 놀랐나요? <웃음> 제가 이것을 보는 순간 아, 나도 여기에 속해서 돈을 벌수 있다 이런 생각을 하는 순간 램 스커팅 문제가 발생을 하게 됩니다. 또한 초기 가격 대비 현재 가격이 지금 15배 정도 하고 있습니다. 이것도 놀라운 가격인데요. 두 번째 문제점은 너무 높은 가격입니다. 지금 램 1기가바이트 현재 가격이 200만 달러 거의 22억에 해당합니다. 이것은 뎁들이 US 플랫폼에 진입하는데 엄청난 어, 부작용을 어, 초래할 수가 있습니다. 많은 코스트가 필요하기 때문입니다. 마지막 세 번째는 무엇일까요? 어, 혹시 어, 생각나는 아이디어가 있나요? 기간입니다. 
이 모든 일이 한달 동안 일어났습니다. 10년이 아니라 한달 동안 이, 일어난 일입니다. 얼마나 이램 스코팅 문제가 심각한 문제인지를 보여주는 것입니다. 아, 이것이 왜 중요하냐 하면 은 EOS가 대 플랫폼이기 때문에 중요한 것입니다. 아래 그림과 같이 다양한 댑들이 EOS 플랫폼에서 운영되기 위해 진입을 기다리고 있습니다. 하지만 높은 램 가격은 이 댑들이 EOS 플랫폼에 진입하는 데 코스트 측면에서 많은 장애를 줄 수가 있습니다. 램 스커팅 문제는 일종의 램 자원 할당의 문제로 볼 수가 있습니다. EOS는 특이하게 램 자원을 램 마켓을 통해 할당을 하고 있습니다. 하지만 앞에서 본것 같이 많은 어, 이런 램 마켓은 많은 문제를 발생시키고 있습니다. 어, 이 때문에 많은 어, 램 스코팅에 대한 많은 논의가 이루어졌고 그 중에 댄 라이, 라리모는 어, 블록당 1KB의 램을 어, 비율로 증가시키는 방법을 제안하기도 했습니다. 그 외에 여러 가지 방법을, 방법들이 제안되었습니다. 하지만 이 모든 방법이 가지고 있는 가정, 큰 가정이 있습니다. 그것은 이들 모든 제안들이 램 자원이 희소하다는 가정을 하고 있다는 것입니다. 즉 램의 공급은 제한되어 있다고 생각하는 것입니다. 그에 따라서 램을 분배할 때 가격에 의해서 수요를 제한하는 방법을 사용하는 것입니다. 그래서 이 아래 보이는 벤코 알고리즘을 사용해서 램 자원을 분배를 하고 있습니다. 하지만 램 가격이 높아질수록 댑들이 EOS 플랫폼에서 돌리는 비용이 증가하기 때문에 댑 활성화를 저해하게 됩니다. 이와 같이 램 높은 램 가격과 EOS 플랫폼의 활성화 사이에는 트레이드 오프 관계가 발생을 합니다. 하지만 우리에겐 좋은 소식이 있습니다. 그것은 EOS가 사이드 체인을 지원한다는 것입니다. 이를 통해서 무제한적인 확장성이 가능합니다. 또한 가지 여기서 중요한 것은 어, BP들이 자원 램 자원을 확장할 때 어, 비용이 발생하게 되는데 그때 대부분의 비용이 이 사이드 체인 즉 새로운 체인을 추가할 때 발생한다는 것입니다. 우리는 이두 가지 사실로부터 어, 램 스코팅에 대한 어, 문제 어, 해결점을 찾았습니다. 저희는 이것을 자발적 인프라스트럭처 그로스라고 불립니다. 이것의 핵심은 BP들에게 어, 새, 어, 새로운 체인을 추가할 때마다 충, 충분한 그런 수익을 보장하자는 것입니다. 이를 통해서 어, 그렇다면 어, 아, sorry. 어, 조금 긴장돼서 <웃음> 말이 좀 꼬이고 있습니다. 어, 이와 같이 BP들에게 어떤 새, 어, 새, 새로운 체인을 추가할 때마다 더 그들의 이익을 보장한다면 은 BP들은 자발적으로 어, 새 체인을 추가하려고 노력, 노력할 것입니다. 이를 통해서 우리는 거의 무제한적인 램 공급 어, 모델을 어, 제시할 수가 있습니다. 여기에서 두 가지 문제가 발생을 하는데요. 첫 번째는 그러면 언제 사이드 체인을 추가할 것인가 하는 문제고 또 하나는 BP들에게 보상을 어떻게 할 것인가에 대한 문제입니다. 
아, 첫 번째는 저희가 논아준 프린트물을 참고하시고 이건 두 번째에 대한 것입니다. 아, 그에 대한 대안으로서 우리는 기존의 BP 페이 모델과 또 저희가 제안했던 장비 보상을 포함한 BP 페이 모델을 저희가 제안했었는데요. 두 방법에 대한 두 방법으로 BP, BP들에게 보상을 하는 방법을 제안을 했습니다. 이것은 프린트물을 확인해 주시기 바랍니다. 결론적으로 어, 저희들은 이 USD 즉 달러 가격으로 일정한 가격으로 램을 공급할 수 있다고 생각을 합니다. 이렇게 되면은 대들의 대들이 어, 진입 가격 아, EOS 플랫폼의 진입 가격을 일정 시간에 따라 일정하게 하는 효과가 있고 또 다른 효과는 어, 투기를 기본적으로 가격이 시간에 따라 일정하기 때문에 막는 효과가 있습니다. 이를 통해서 대 플랫폼이 더 활성화될 수 있는 그런 바탕이 되는 것입니다. 부부 관계가 이제 서로 이제 어, 행복하게 되시 이제 대 플랫폼과 이램 가격 간에 서로 화해가 일어나서 좀더 좋은 대 플랫폼이 되기를 기대합니다. 아, 이것은 저희가 제안했던 것들인데요. 이와 같이 여섯 개가 있고 그것은 책에서 확인을 할 수가 있습니다. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for that uh, interesting discussion on the RAM problem, and that actually leads us very nicely to. the last panel for today and that is a continuation of this discussion what is the deal with the ram problem and this will be moderated by nathan james from scatter nathan come on up here please and nathan will introduce the other panelists so i'll turn you over to nathan Good afternoon. I'm Nathan James with Scatter. Why don't we just start introducing yourself? You want to go first? Hello, I'm Jesus Chiti from EOS Argentina. I'm really happy to be in this panel uh, talking about RAM. I think RAM issues not only technological, but it's also philosophical um, and uh, an economic uh, subject. So I am really glad to be here. Thank you. Nathan. I am Michael Yates from EOS Stack. Um, We're very interested in the RAM price because we're different from other BPs. We actually will need RAM to operate. Uh, if we don't get enough RAM, we will not be a DAC, so it's very interesting to us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Daniel Zhang from Chance Exchange. We are the world's first exchange that focus on EUC ecology. And also, since we talk about RAM today, so maybe you have heard about an account named the CUC Me One. It also the world's second largest account I mean, the RAM holder in the world, and also is uh, occupied by, by Chan's CEO and his partners, including me. So I think I'm very glad to be here, introduce more about our opinion about RAM. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eyal Herzog. I'm a co-founder at uh, Bancor and a product architect. And um, also with Liquid EOS, which is the block producer uh, created by Bancor. Bancor is today one of the largest, most popular decentralized application on Ethereum. We process millions of dollars per day on, on our uh, decentralized liquidity network. And RAM is also very important for us uh, uh, for that reason, because we, we want to use EOS. We came from a DAP developer perspective to this whole thing. So you guys all know about RAM, obviously. You've done your due diligence. How would you explain RAM to people who come from other blockchains and who needs it the most? Is it the developers? Is it the users? And when is that interchangeable? I, I, you know, everyone is talking here about the, um, you know, I saw a slide about the um, transaction per second of EOS, which is amazing, right? I mean, we don't see those numbers with, with other blockchains. And I think 
you know, RAM is the reason that we can do that because EOS is built in such a way that they're doing all the transaction in memory. However, you know, this is a very scarce resource uh, and, and very expensive one. And, and, and this is why it's important to allocate it in the best optimal way uh, in order to allow, on one hand, those amazing performances that I think are, you know, what's going to make take auction to the mainstream. I mean, it's, it's as important as that on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, you know, we, we're dealing here with a resource which is, which is different and we need to learn how to manage it in the most optimal way. Uh, actually, there are many people, they want RAM and there are many people, they need RAM as well. I would say, you know, for developers, they need RAM to develop those D apps and other things. And for example, like our ch chance, we got our own tokens named CET. We do the airdrops to every use holders worldwide. And this kind of uh, airdrops, when the RAM price is not that high, it still costs about more than two thousands of use. I mean, so, uh, so currently, many people is, will say that the uh, RAM price is too high, and those uh, airdrop projects, they cannot afford it. So the first developers need it. And second part also, there are more people want RAM. They are not developers, they are just focused on price and they care about the price. They want to earn more money. You know why there are so many people come to talk about RAM? It's because you know the price line goes up like this and then price drop like this. So I mean, if there is no this kind of line, there, no be, there won't be so many people care about it. So I mean, I would like to divide it this topic into two parts. The first is developers, they really need it. And second part is the traders, they want to earn money. Okay, so um, RAM is memory, which means that uh, if you access something today, you, you need to remember it for tomorrow. So that's very important for your token balances because you don't want them to disappear tomorrow. Um, so everybody uses RAM. Um, people mainly focus on the developers using the RAM, but actually, uh, a particular DAP can choose between paying for the RAM themselves and they can also ask the users to supply the RAM. Um, so in the case of tokens, actually the users pay for the RAM. It's not necessarily the DAP that pays Once for the RAM. Once they touch it. Once they have transferred it to somebody else. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but it's not always the DAP developer who pays. So RAM is actually a problem for everybody, especially as we go on uh, and we go one to two years into EOS. Uh, we may find that the users themselves are actually running out of RAM and having to pay for RAM just to use the system. So um, it, it's important for everybody, not just airdroppers. Yeah, well, like Michael said, uh, RAM is where the data is stored. So I basically see two groups of people uh, that are interested in RAM, even though everybody uses it. So you have the regular accounts that need uh, RAM to store you know, their account name, balance, and so on. Uh, the default value is a eight, eight kbytes to you know where account is created, but it can be run with a bit less than that. Um, those users, uh, you know, it's arguable if 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 the RAM price is currently high or not. If you compare it with other blockchains, right? Because you will pay maybe thirteen dollars now, but then you won't pay transaction fees. You probably won't need it. Uh, compared to maybe Bitcoin that you'll pay one do or two dollars per transaction. So you'll make five, six Bitcoin transactions and you already covered the price of RAM in EOS. But then you have another group of people that are developers. And that's the, kind th that's the group of people that we want and maybe the group of people that we are concerned about uh, because they use, uh, you know, they need to store tables and, and, and other stuff on, on the blockchain and they might need a lot of RAM, uh, which, which could get quite pricey. So following that, uh, with the price of creation for users, we know that it is a, a little bit of a problem right now. It has reached, uh, what was it, three EOS to create a, an account at some point. And when we're talking about the blockchain, we actually want to affect change in places where they're, quote unquote, the unbanked. Who would sustain that cost and how could the block producers possibly help countries that need it the most? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I was talking to uh, I from EOS Nation uh, and, you know, they do a lot of meetups and they provide uh, in Nigeria and other poor countries, you know, they provide the assistance to create accounts. I think uh, it is something that block producers could do, not only create accounts, but there is also other available services. Crypto Alliance also talked about uh, creating a token as a service or even helping with airdrops. Uh, and that's another issue, uh, airdrops that we could talk later because there are ways to use, you know, 
less RAM and be more RAM effective. Uh, and BPs have an important role to uh, teach developers to use as little RAM as possible. Um, let's remember that RAM is not a, is, is a resource that you can recover once used. So it becomes an asset. It's kind of like a property because RAM has a value uh, with the current system. So yes, you spend a lot of money on RAM, but then that RAM is yours. You can either sell it or you can use it on other uh, dApps. And that's also an important factor to consider uh, because we need to clear out the noise from you know, from the media uh, and stuff, you know, it's important to understand how RAM works and what it is, uh, because it's not like uh, you you buy a house and then, you know, you spend a lot of money in the house, but then you have a house, you have a property, you have an asset. Uh, so that's also an important factor to, to consider when talking about the RAM price. I think that um, regarding use cases like, you know, um, uh, banking the unbanked and all that, I think those use cases actually match, you know, fit perfectly to the, to the solution like side chains, we're actually ourselves uh, we're, we're studying a, a project of com community currencies in in Kenya, and uh, obviously they cannot pay even Ethereum transaction fee because 50 cents is like half of their daily salary for a single transaction that doesn't make any sense. But we're working with a company called Poa Network that that is actually you know using That's a great name, yeah, <laughs> and and they're they're. They have a side chain, and you know, obviously, there's no transaction fees there. So, I think for those use cases, that will be probably the solution. Uh, having said all that, I think that you know, as much as we raise the barrier to how much it costs to uh, have an, you know, to launch an application on EOS, then it means that we'll have less and less applications and, and less and less use cases that make sense financially, and we don't want to do that. Now, the, you know, you said. RAM is like, you know, it's like an asset, right? So, you know, I buy RAM and, and then I can sell it. The, you know, the, there is an issue with that because I cannot rent RAM. You know, if I, if I could rent it, it wouldn't be such a problem. But it's impossible today. Uh, so if, imagine a real estate market where everyone can buy houses. Everyone that want to develop an application can buy a houses. But people can buy houses just for investment. And if you cannot rent the house, then all the houses that were bought as an investment, because people believe that the price will go up in the future, they will stand empty. This is really bad resource utilization. So um, the, I, I, th I think that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I, th I think w there are solutions for that, and, 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 and we should strive for a solution for that and strive to make sure that the resource utilization is high, uh, as high as possible, without uh, you know without hurting the, the free market principle and and there are ways to do that like you could have a property task tax on, on a house making it a bad long-term investment right. you know it can be a good short term but not, not a good long term and I, I think this is where where we should focus our efforts so on the note the note of side chains I think uh, they are definitely a long-term scaling solution when we start to hit limits um, but at the moment I don't think we should be looking at that until we've sorted out the the problem on the current chain otherwise we're just going to give speculators another bite of the cherry we could end up having the same problem across chains sorry we could end up having similar problems across chains uh, we would have the same problem across chain because the banker algorithm is so predictable we know that we just buy more and it will automatically go up and we're going to hit an inflection point where it just goes the moon and we're we all don't say that word here yeah <laughs> sorry uh, I would say that side chain and also the renting they are all good options and uh, also they need a lot of deserve a lot of uh, discussion a lot and I would like to provide another view from another aspects because since chance we are not a BP we are exchange, change and we are the world's first use focus exchange I would say chance is the world first that can support the real RAM trading in the exchange this has a it's a very meaningful thing why about that? Because for normal people, if you want to buy rum, you need at least has a wallet. And it will take about $30 US dollars to open an account. But if you can trade rum in an exchange, you can save this kind of money. And also, we can support the trading pairs of rum and use and compare, uh, combine this with what I just mentioned. I mean, the real rum trading and buying, you can you know, have the listing function to trade RAM very easily, just as uh, you buy any other kind of tokens. And uh, why I say it's meaningful? Because it can lower or even disappear, make the barrier, entry barrier disappears for normal people. Because we all know that the money or the people's uh, attention about RAM is still low compared with, you know, there are almost uh, uh, one billion youth outside. So, I mean, 
this kind of uh, thing can attract more people to care about use, to, uh, to care about RAM. And also, uh, this kind of thing will accelerate the process. Mean, I mean, the RAM price and also this development will move to a balance. That's also a double-edged sword because it keeps the focus on the volatility of the RAM and brings in the speculators while the rest of the network suffers, in a sense, the DAP developers and whatnot. Volatility is almost worse than the, the, the price um, because if you make a business plan today, uh, you will factor in the, the cost of and your business um, and then you, you actually raise the money and then it's tripled or quadrupled in and price. And there has and been airdrops which have stopped in the middle and haven't had yeah. even the chance to continue yeah. since they stopped. I believe ADD ran out of RAM. Also, quickly. yes. Yeah. Um, here's, so, okay. Here's a hard question. The airdrops cost a lot of money. Is that a bad thing? Yes. Are you sure? Well, I don't yes. think so. Because uh, I just mentioned that our chance token CT would cost about 2,000 to 3,000 uh, use. Well, right it's now. a big amount of money, for sure. But is that a bad thing? I don't think so. Because if the cost is very, very low, there will be so many airdrops, and they will attract the attention, and it turns out to be a, you know, it's a no, no meaning and no value. And that will be attract a lot of attention from us. So I think why they designed the drum or the use price at this level, because they don't want so many low quality and bad things happens in use ecology. You know, there are many other choice for what I just mentioned, kind of the apps, they can choose sidechain, they can choose, uh, you, you know, cost a lower price to do the airdrops and uh, other things. So I think keep the RAM on, uh, I mean, maybe at today's level is good thing because it can help us only accept good DApps airdrops. Yeah, well, um, this is actually a very interesting, right? Because we are currently 35 days in, so in like in the kind of price discovery phase, so we don't know as to what, what would be that threshold, you know, that uh, they are talking about that threshold that, you know, who, who decides what the threshold is or not, you know. We, we enter this philosophical um, discussion, and that's why the, 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 the RAM, you know, is so interesting. Uh, we are currently working with our team uh, to put out um, ways in, in, in which you can, do, you can do airdrops, which probably will take longer, but you can consume less RAM. Why, does, uh, wh why do airdrops consume so much RAM? Because you need to store all the data from the accounts uh, on blockchain so that, in, so that they can be claimed, right? Uh, so uh, there could be some ways around it uh, that could make it cheaper. Either way, I believe that there is the BP role to, you know, to provide this uh, service to filter, you know, they could filter the projects that are worthwhile, and then, uh, you know, we're getting paid for, uh, especially this, you know, to uh, provide adoption in, in, in the EOS blockchain. You know? So this could be a very, very interesting service that I, I am hoping that, uh, you know, many BPs can come up and say, you know, we'll provide this as a service and we will do it effectively, you know. You can roll them out in, ba in batches, for example, you can roll out uh, you know, in batches so that it doesn't consume so, so much RAM. So it is very interesting, uh, and I believe the BPs have to intervene so that it's a bit cheaper, because right now, if you want to do an airdrop to uh, all the Genesis accounts, I think it's around 10K EOS, which is quite a lot of money, and the blockchain keeps growing, so it would actually be much more expensive if you want to do an airdrop to all the accounts at the moment. Yeah, so can I just say about airdrops, um, we don't just airdrop just for marketing purposes or as a gimmick. We, we really believe that the distribution of the ownership and the, the control of dApps within the ecosystem is incredibly important. Um, and people see uh, an airdrop as some sort of like junk mail that comes into your inbox, but actually we store it in our database. We just put your name next to it. So we're not like throwing things at you. Um, the, the wallets, uh, Igor, are to blame um, because they do not filter. That at the moment, they're just showing every single airdrop. And yeah, you're right, they could get out of control. You could have hundreds of thousands of uh, spam tokens appearing in your wallet. Um, so I think that's a, a user interface problem, which will be fixed fairly soon. I, I, I think, yeah, I agree with you. It's a, it, it, it is a matter of balance. And uh, you, you know, we don't want to, Airdrop can be used in in in, in um, 
I would say, funny way because, because if you airdrop a lot of tokens to a lot of users that have no idea what this token is and don't care, so first of all, it's going to show your market cap much higher than it really is because you know most of the holders, they don't care about it. Um, but I, I think that you know, maybe there is a, a room to think about a system which is more proactive. So yeah, you have a great project. You know, tell everyone about project. Let's have a, like an airdrop site where people can go and engage and say, oh, I'm interested in this and this and this, and they will pay for what needs to be paid in order to get that because you know, they care about it. So maybe, maybe it should be a little bit more proactive, but you know, we're really in the beginning and airdrop is really, um, I would say, essential part of how EOS business model was designed. So we're yet to see how, how, where this thing uh, going. We've seen a couple people do this already. There's Air Grabs, thank you, Said from Yes Cafe, who you can have users claim their own RAM in the row in the table, and then the DAP doesn't have any cost for the airdrop. Uh, so there is ways around this. There's also ways for for RAM lending by changing private key, public keys to somebody else, and such and such. Uh, but we're not there yet. It's still a little yeah, bit. So of an Air Grab is. Uh, you're, you're just passing the cost of the RAM on to the, user. the users. Yeah. However, the benefit of that is that you only get the users who want your tokens. That's true. And uh, actually, if the users continue to, to accept the air, airdrops or air grabs, um, they themselves will run out of RAM. Um, right. And then they will have to have the same problem that we're having, and they're going to have to fork out you know, 10 EOS or whatever for their RAM, which for a well, it can't happen user, continually. It's, it's quite a lot. Sorry? It can't actually happen continually. It has to be snapped at one point and then stopped. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the actual, because everybody states that there is an issue with RAM. What do you think the actual issue is? Is it just volatility? Is it just that it costs too much? Is it just that it makes it hard to get people into the system? Or is there something more here? I think you should not allow uh, speculation in a finite, a finite and required resources. It's fundamental. Yeah. You, should not, you should not allow the, the, this because, because sure, you know, if people think, oh, there's going to be so much application discovering, uh, uh, developers discovering EOS, and they want to you know, move over and they want to buy, they, they'll need to buy RAM. And if someone predicts that and buys the RAM in advance, it's actually making this future less probable <laughs> because it makes it more expensive for everyone to do that. And uh, I, I think that that is the, and, and the main problem is that there is no, no price for this speculation. There's, there's, or there's a little fee that, that you pay when you trade, but developers pay the same thing. And uh, you know, Liquid EOS came up with this uh, um, proposal to, to, make, to, to actually burn EOS from that contract. Now, burning EOS is like airdropping EOS on all the users, economically speaking. It's the same thing. So essentially, whoever holds RAM at every given moment is essentially paying rent for that RAM to the entire community, which I think would make it much less of appealing of an investment. And, and that would take the prices down. And if we... Um, wouldn't have anything like that, you know, you, you should expect, you know, people to make that investment because that is the, you know, the right thing to do financially for them. And you shouldn't expect anyone to care about how much RAM, I mean, any, any speculator, he shouldn't care about how much RAM uh, will cost to the application developers. That's not his job. That's our job to think about that. So... Well, I actually think um, it's a very interesting issue, Ram, because um, it's not only one point to consider. Because on the one hand, it's a, it's a scarce resource, right, uh, at the moment. Uh, so, so that makes it, of course, uh, that, that, that makes it valuable in a way. Of course, it, it has a price and it's valuable to some people, for some people more than others. Uh, but then there is also another issue about uh, information uh, of BPs and people who uh, make the decision of, of when to increase RAM, of what to do with RAM, and that decision, and how that could affect price, and you know, insider trading, and so on. And that's probably uh, another thing that should be addressed. 
Uh, I would love to hear, th there is a couple of proposals. Um, uh, I've heard from third parties the Liquidius proposal, I think it's really interesting. I would, uh, you know, I would like to see it like probably uh, more formally, I especially when does, wh uh, the timing of when those uh, ramp, uh, does those EOS get burned? Because it's all about, it, that's all about sensitive uh, information and that's something I would like to know. We haven't spoken privately, but you know, I've heard something about that proposal. There's also, uh, um, you know, a supply decision of when to increase uh, the run supply. Uh, I don't think that's a decision that should be made, uh, you know, uh, prematurely. It needs to be uh, decided, uh, but eventually, you know, 64 gigabytes of RAM is, is not going to be enough, so eventually we're going to have to increase the supply. And when we make that decision, of course, it's going to have an impact in price if we keep uh, the banker algorithm that we have now, like the free market algorithm. Okay, uh, this gentleman just mentioned about speculation about RAM. Well, people may be afraid or they don't like this kind of words, but I would say the speculation is the core or maybe the key motivation and also the incentive of so many things, especially in financial market. There is a saying in traditional China that if you want to stop something, compared with stop, you better find a way out for this kind of thing. I think it's the same rule for the speculation. Because people always want to think about some rules, stop all the speculation about RAM. But I think, why don't we find another way to help those people who like speculation? They can also understand the risk behind that, and they can to try or play this kind of game. For example, like DRAM, this kind of thing, the directives can help those people like speculation find their own place. And this DRAM can also help to balance the you know, the fluctuation of the RAM price. So I think this may be another way to think about this question. Yeah, I, I agree that speculation is important, but you know, uh, if you Google like why, is specula why speculation is good in Google, uh, you know, the first, the, the first result will be invest Investopedia, I, I believe that that's the site. And they give a good example uh, that, that is very, very easy to understand. They say, let's say there is a drought. And everyone is um, expecting the oil price, uh, not the oil price, the rice, pr the price of rice to go up. So that would make speculator buy uh, rice futures. And they will buy those futures, and uh, then the farmers will see the price of the future, they will, oh, maybe we should grow more rice. So they're actually fixing the, 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 the supply side of the market by being speculator, that's a good thing. But Notice that I say rice futures. They don't need to buy actual rice and make people hungry. <laughs> they need rice futures. And, and that is part of our suggestion uh, of Liquid EOS to allow RAM futures. So, you know, we know that we're gonna upgrade the network. Let's say we decide we're gonna upgrade in a few months. And there's a market where people can buy this future RAM that we're gonna have and not pay any tax on it and not you know, and in, 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 in that RAM, the, the price will remain constant. So, so you don't pay rent on the future RAM, but you only pay rent on actual existing RAM. So I think there is room for speculation, and that speculation is also important for application developers that know that they will have the application ready in six months. So they can buy RAM futures and use it in six months. So I think there's room for that. We should allow that. And you know, there would not be a problem with speculation if it was rentable, because then it would mean that we'll have to, uh, this is a technical problem we're dealing with, with that you cannot rent RAM. So what can you do? You know, you, you, you need to get to higher utilization, and, and that's why uh, I think we should split it to two different markets. The problem with the renting is uh, at some point you have to evict people who don't pay and the data is actually worth a considerable amount of money to others rather than the uh, renter or the, the leaser. So it, it can have a, a wide effect. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should allow renting. I'm just saying this is the reality. We cannot rent RAM. We need to find another solution. Well, the rent itself could be paid by the system as a whole. Uh, via fees on trading. I, I agree. I, yeah. I'm saying because you cannot practically rent it from one to another, what yeah. we have now is speculating holding RAM that is not being utilized. If, yeah. if it was theoretically possible, then at least we would get to a high utilization, which is what it's all about. It's about allowing as many decentralized applications as we can. Yeah. 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 It, so it's really interesting what Yal was saying because it, we can't rent it on chain, but it's, it's exactly what I was talking about at the beginning that it would be interesting to have a service where 
doesn't have to be a BP where an entity buys a lot of RAM or, or, or can create an account by a lot of RAM. Um, so it can provide you the service of doing an airdrop. You can provide the parameters of the token you want to create, and then the airdrop will be created. This is just an idea, like we, we just, you know, that it could be done. Or you could create an account with RAM and keep the owner key so you can change the owner key after that RAM is utilized. But that, that will, uh, of course, depend on the private entities of creating this. If ideally, we want it to be on the blockchain. Uh, just one quick thing I wanted to say about speculation, and I think um, we also have to be fair with people that uh, speculated on the system, uh, and when I say we, I mean the EOS ecosystem, because at the beginning this was something that was allowed, and you know uh, the rules were set, so you, you use the bank or algorithm to buy and probably make money afterwards. So a lot of people uh, bought RAM expecting future returns because it was allowed, and that's how the system was laid out. Now we want to, of course, control this because it got out of hand, and we want to um, probably push the down, uh, push down the down uh, the price of RAM. Uh, but I think there is a that there is a, a pinch of uh, of our own fault because at the beginning this was something that was allowed, and many people were probably even incentive to you know buy RAM, hold RAM, because they were told that the price would go up. It became a game and a fun game at that, and people got hooked. And they kept playing. Yeah, so that, that's the story of crypto. <laughs> yeah. So this is true. A lot of people played the game. And a lot of fees taken. And at some point, the largest holder, if something isn't done, is going to be the RAM fee account. So what do you guys think should actually be done with all of those funds that were accrued from fees? Fees on the RAM trading? Fees on the RAM trading. Yeah, I believe they are burned, right? No, no, no they're, they're actually on the EOSIO uh, dot RAM fee. Right. Um, Can I they think that's one of the good things that's come out of all of this. You know, we, we're taking a lot of EOS out. Uh, we don't, again, I, I will insist, and I've seen other uh, BPs uh, say the same, like uh, Ice from EOS Nation, you know. Uh, let's, there's only been 35 days, and it seems like it's been a year. Uh, decisions need to be made with, you know, a lot of prior consultation and debate. And I believe one of the most important things uh, to get done, like it's been said before, is the referendum contract. Uh, because at the moment, it's like BPs deciding on issues as important. I think it has more than one and a half million uh, EOS, maybe, that, that account. I haven't checked recently. But you know, th this is something that definitely should be decided by the community uh, and not by 15 BPs. It's the one thing that I actually believe should take a year. For sure. For sure. Uh, but at the moment, it's a good thing that it's being taken out of the market. Yeah. I would disagree with that, I think. I think that, that we should allow time for debate. There should be uh, every time for everyone to present their proposals and the pros and cons. Um, and then we, we just need to make some proposals and we sign it or we don't sign it. Um, we're beholden to our, our voters. And if we do things that they don't like, they definitely tell us. You know, They're not shy about... Um, telling us when they're upset when we do things. So uh, I think we need to give it maybe a, another couple of weeks. I think we're going to see two or three proposals, actual code, which we can uh, make a, a signed proposal for. And then all the BPs will just decide which one they prefer, and they will sign one or the other. And uh, if something passes 15, it gets activated. Well, 0 0.5 percentage is quite high number, I mean, especially for I mean, this game keeps going, and uh, the fees and all these fees will keep goes up. So, I mean, this kind of money uh, comes from the U.S. ecology, comes from every trader, every RAM holders. So, I think uh, probably this kind of money should be used back to the U.S. US ecology. Maybe if personally, I think education is a good choice. Let more people know the risk be behind the RAM. Let more people know about uh, U.S. ecology and all their things, and I think maybe a good choice. And also, I agree that there should be uh, as more as possible proposals for people to think about that, because uh, this need deserves a very careful discussion to make sure, I mean, it's kind of influence in quite a long time. So, yeah, I, again, I, I think that... We have about one minute, so... Burning EOS, burning EOS is, is, is a form of payment to the entire community. So that, I, I would consider that as the default, right? Because it, who owns EOS? It's like everyone that holds EOS tokens. And, and then, you know, then burning them is like airdropping them. So, so that's the, if, if, we, if there's anything else we want to do, 
then uh, you know obviously it, it can be proposed and discussed, but um, that 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 should be the default round. Absolutely. Let's give a hand for all these guys who are working really hard on RAM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Hey, um, so uh, it is a conference, and it's uh, one thing that I wanted to make sure is that this is not Node 1 event. This is actually community's event. And then this event being in Korea, I'd like to invite all the Korean BPs, all the Korean BPs to the stage. So uh, I see uh, Orchid, Aquarius, who else? All the Korean BPs, please come up onto the stage. So, uh, we are Korean. So, let us say, really, I just really wanted to say something. We are all Korean BPs, and then Korea, as I just said. Let me ask one question first. What is the EOS price right now? What is the EOS price right now? It's a 8, 8.2, 8.3. .2, you know, there's a negative kimchi premium right now. You know what I mean? Six months ago, it's a 60% kimchi premium. You should remember that, all right? These guys have been helping a lot. Yours pay, he's been showing his product and he's been donating he, what he can, you know, help us. Yours is, Yours is helping a lot, Orchid, adding a lot of value. Acroyus, having interview all of you guys. Excellent. They're making a, such a great tool to uh, voting tools for proxy voters and in, in a, such a fair way. So, you know, you gotta learn more of our Korean community. So uh, as a whole Korean part of the EOS community, we want to thank you all for being here. So please, <laughs> thank you. And us being here, and us being here, because we are all family, right? We are, we, are, we are EOS family. We don't care about the country. We don't care about the country border. We are EOSians, right? So I want to propose you come together, close, to take some great so one group photo. Please, those guys around you, come close. Come close to, to second, two rows in the front. Please, please, please come close. Everybody. Please, no, 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 not on the stage, here. The photographer is gonna be standing here. Yeah. Yeah, not on the stage. Please get close, please, please. I see you many people there. Come close, come close. Okay, later. Please, I want to see everybody in the picture. So, can you please move to the, this row? Thank you, thank you very much. Hoshi, where are you going now? Where are you going?
please, this guy, you, you guys, please move this row. Yeah. Please. Matthew, come closer. Please, please come closer and to the middle. Here's empty. Oh, you think what? Okay. We're gonna test shooting one time. Look here, look here, look him, look at him. Thank you very much. Um, a few announcements. So there's a, for you, you know, we gotta know, you, you, you wanna know each other more, right? So we, we gotta, uh, we rented Shagar room with some coffee. So spend some time connecting each other, uh, connecting with each other. And then you can make a group and then you are free to go and eat. So we just shared the links of the uh, recommended restaurants in UCC 2018. Check that out. And then you have a plan at a time. So tomorrow's agenda begins at 1 p.m. Enjoy your night. All right? Enjoy. Make it to the fullest. That's it. Thank you for being here. Hold, hold. One sec. One sec. Hold it. Stick there. Stick there. One sec. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Brock Pierce! Welcome, Brock. Oh my God. Thank you. So good to see all of you. Uh, what an amazing uh, turnout of you know, people that are actually doing the work you know, building the systems, you know, that are governing, you know, this most exciting of projects, you know, from the Magna Carta to here, um, in Seoul, that city that's got Seoul, you take the E out of it, that's the Seoul, you take the U out of it, that's the Seoul. <laughs> um, what an exciting time, what have we been live? Six weeks, coming up on seven weeks right now. Does it feel like six weeks? <laughs> Six weeks of burning the candle at both ends, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, look at all that we've accomplished in that short period of time. What, uh, third most active blockchain, seeing incredible transactions per second. Uh, and look at the amount of community involvement. And, you know, I'm chain agnostic. I believe that if anyone builds something that makes the world a better place, we all win. And I'm here to help everyone that's got good intentions trying to do good things. You know, I, I don't get into that argument of my chain is better than your chain. I, it reminds me of religious fanaticism. And over the last few thousand years, we, we've learned that doesn't work. You know, keep an open mind. We're building open source systems with open minds and open hearts. You know, the chestahedron. We're doing it in this case with some sacred geometry. If you haven't spent the time to learn what the EOS logo is, take the time to go watch one of Frank Chester's, you know, videos. And you know, this is one of the most interesting pieces of sacred geometry, uh, maybe the most important symbol discovered in the last thousand years. You know, the most important geometric symbol. This is not just a cool logo. It's incredibly interesting. How many of you are familiar with, like, the platonic solids, the five platonic solids? So Socrates was killed, basically, to give you this information because he didn't encrypt it. And so Plato ended up encrypting most of Socrates' knowledge into images and into writings. And those are like the five platonic solids. This is the equivalent of number seven. It's a big deal. We're spending some time understanding it um, because it is the sacred geometrical shape of the heart. 
and what I see in this community that I haven't seen in any of the other crypto communities, you know, is just there's a there's a level of like heart when you walk into these rooms. There's a level of sort of like just people with good intentions and good attitudes. I just feel so much light and so much love when I'm at any sort of EOS community event. Last night, again today, you know, at the tail end of it, I had to go with a camera crew this morning to the DMZ because a lot of my focus is, um, you know, kind of transcending the work that we do in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Obviously, I'm still active and here to serve and be helpful to the extent I can always with the time that I have. It's all yours. But, uh, you know, my focus right now is on where in the world are we going to, you know, see these fires start, fires start to see these lighthouses emerge that show people that there is another way, that we can do things better than we've done it in the past. I often talk about this Japanese word of Kaizen, which is to continually improve. A lot of the things that I see in the world today is, you know, we've built a world of mediocrity. If you've ever seen that triangle or that pyramid that says good, fast, cheap, pick two, something happened. Somewhere along the way, we went astray and we just started making things that were fast and cheap and we forgot about good. We forgot about building things well and the way that you do that is by always attempting to do things as well as you can by doing your best. Why would you want to do anything less? And when you get up tomorrow, you do it even better. And through that process of continuing, continuing to improve, you know, that's what makes you great. That's what will make you someone that produces great things. And so, uh, uh, you know, in a place like Korea, obviously this is a, an extremely interesting year to be here. Um, you know, going back to the Korean War, you've had this division of one people, you know, out at that bridge, the bridge that was one way, you could cross from south into north, but you could never come back, you know. Hotel California, <laughs> you could never leave. <laughs> and so families divided, and the idea that there's, you know, the possibility, the potential of Korean unification, you know, these are the types of messages, these are the types of stories, these are the inspirations, you know, that the world needs right now. And, you know, what an amazing time to be here, because that possibility is now on the table. I'm also very focused right now on the Philippines because the Philippines is the market that looks to me most likely to deliver on the, the promise of financial inclusion. You know, the other half of the humans that live on this planet that are not financially included, that don't have access to banking systems or very limited access to banking systems. And the Philippines is very interesting. It's got a population of 100 million people. 80% of whom are unbanked. They were the largest social networking market when Friendster was out. That was where Friendster's largest user base was. So it's not like they don't get it. It's not like they're a connected society. They speak English, a whole bunch of things. And coins.ph, as well as the other entrepreneurs that have been actively building down there over the last three, four years, they have 5% market share of the population on blockchain wallets, a lot of which is for money remittance. You know, Filipinos that leave the Philippines to go work abroad to generate money to send back home to their families, making, you know, kind of the ultimate sacrifice, you know, to go off to the Middle East or wherever it is that they end up going to, you know, work pretty hard and far from home, but for the benefit of others. And so uh, they had, you know, in terms of money remittance, this is the movement of money, they used to have 28% of their GDP that came from money remittance. That's down now because things have actually been going well there. But you now have a government there that's created a special economic zone. You've got a central bank that's on board because they recognize the potential for the impact. And this is government that is actually being stewards and actually thinking about what is best for their people and what they need. And so the Philippines are going to get very interesting. I don't know how much you know about the Ring of Fire, but that's the entire Pacific Ring. It's feeling very much like we're entering into the Pacific century right now. You know, this is where the action is. And to bring it back to the last of the three places I'm focused on, some of you may know, but Puerto Rico is, uh, is one of them. You know, Puerto Rico is where Christopher Columbus first sailed 
uh, first landed in the Bahamas, but he set up shop in Puerto Rico. So all of Europe's influence on the Americas essentially began in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, like the Philippines, both were part of the United States in 1898. At the end of the Spanish War, they were both given as concessions to the United States, kind of like brother and sister, siblings of sorts. And so what was the first state isn't the 51st state, it's become the, port, it's become the forgotten state. And so they've gone through 500 years of hardship, and there's an opportunity to make a difference there, and some amazing things are happening. Uh, right here, blowing my mind, I mean, certainly one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen is a group of people have come together here and created the Korean-Puerto Rican Friendship Foundation, and they've got 60 Korean blockchain companies looking to move to Puerto Rico, and they're creating scholarships and systems to bring Puerto Ricans to Korea. Uh, I didn't think this Puerto Rican story would resonate across the world. Um, and that's pretty much all the way across. It's uh, uh, an incredible thing to see. And so why is Korea where it is today? Most people might not know that, but it came from the games business. It came from the fact that Korea was the mecca of the games industry for the online game industry. And why did that happen? Uh, it's an interesting history. So when you used to have game consoles, like your Segas, your Playstations, your Nintendos, that was a packaged software business. You would buy a box, you know, take off the plastic, which we need to be using less of, you know, insert your game and play. But piracy was a big problem, or, or put it into your computer, Piracy was a big problem in both China and Korea in terms of gaming. And so you had these huge user bases of people that loved to play these games, but the companies that were producing them weren't able to make any money. And they're like, well, what do we do? How do we, how do we you know, get a business model that will function in these places? And they recognized that they needed to create connected games, online games, networked games, so they could charge a subscription fee for accessing the game server and to create multiplayer games. And so that really emerged here in Korea and then China, you know, the sort of online gaming movement. Um, and that's where the industry and the rest of the world followed from going from packaged software to software as a service. But this was the beginning of virtual worlds. You know, these were the beginning of sort of virtual currencies and virtual assets. A lot of the work that we're doing here in the real world, you know, began there. And so Korea and China having done this for so long, are kind of like five years ahead of the rest of the world. It's just a more evolved culture in terms of understanding, you know, where the digital meets the real. You know, and that's essentially what we're doing today now for real, you know, in the main game. And so uh, what, a, what an exciting thing to see and to see how much is happening here and to see, you know, so much, so much heart in the room. You know, I just want to thank everybody, and I'd love to, you know, I'd love to connect with everyone as, you know, whenever possible. I make all the time that I have. I've committed to living my entire life in this vessel in service, and, you know, I'm here to serve all of you, you know, and to the extent uh, I can be helpful, you know, please reach out. You know, I'm here trying to be everywhere, <laughs> as many places as one can with the time that we have in a day, and you know, it comes at the expense of sleeping. I don't sleep much. This trip, to make it especially challenging, I just flew here from Ibiza. So I've been restoring an ancient farm there, an old castle of sorts, a finca. And uh, I decided on the flight over that I was going to go into a five-day stoic water fast where you go for five days not eating anything, not drinking anything other than water exclusively. Um, while well, burning the candle at both ends and flying from Ibiza. <laughs> um, I made it two and a half days, and then I had to have a little salad. <laughs> but I'm still running on almost nothing but water. Um, it's a good test to, to practice discipline, you know, intermittent fasting. You know, it's important all of us are healthy. You know, we, are, we have important work to do. You know, we are changing the world <laughs> for the better. You know, we are doing things that are going to change the lives of everyone and for billions of people in a major, major way. I mean, I can't think of a better thing to do with our lives. You know, uh, one of the other concepts I talk about often is this 
other Japanese term, and I, I know that the Japanese terms might not be the favorite, but Satoshi used a Japanese pseudonym, so I'm you know playing in that same vein. Um, and this is a concept known, of, known as ikigai, and that is to figure out what you love, what you're passionate about, figure out what you're good at, and what the world needs. You know, and often what you're good at, I, I talk about this concept, is we're, we are all superheroes or we have the potential to be superheroes. You know, what you're good at is, as Malcolm Gladwell would say, what are the things that you put 10,000 hours into? What are the things that uniquely make you, you? And these are your gifts. You know, some of those things come naturally, and we often gravitate to those things that come naturally into our lives because it's easier, <laughs> and it just flows kind of naturally. But you can learn anything. You're capable of most anything. Um, but figuring out what you love, what you're good at, and what the world needs. When you find the center of those three rings, that is finding your life's purpose. And money doesn't even matter at that point. You know, you don't need uh, to focus on making money. The less you focus on making money, in some ways, it actually comes easier. Strangely, if money is not your focus, what will happen is you just do amazing things, and you become really good at, like, making things happen, and and you love every minute of it, so you work really hard at it, and you're playing to your strengths, and you're doing things that benefit others, and the money kind of naturally follows. Uh, it doesn't need to be your focus. Um, and that's an important thing as we talk about what, what is it that we are building here. We're bringing, like, community back. You know, we're kind of moving away from that game of self-interest, you know, where it's just all about me, 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 me. You know, I'm doing things because I'm selfish, you know, I call it the game of com compounding interest, self-interest, you know, the financial term compounding interest. You know, and I, I've, I've stopped playing that game personally. I've moved on to a game that I call compounding impact. You know, and how is it that you go make as big an impact in the world? And life is really good at that point. And so as we build communities, as we think about systems of governance, you know, the way that you build a successful system in this space is by putting your community first, by actually being a steward, and by serving your community first, foremost, and always. You know, if you always put your community first and do what is in the best interest of them, and you've done the other things right, the stars have aligned, you know, you don't need to worry about what you get. You're gonna do pretty well <laughs> because you've served well. And that is how you go from building as we move through the alphabet from A to B as in business from S to C, what we're doing here. We're building communities. And a successful community is one where you don't have leaders that are trying to run with their egos and trying to be in charge and say, it's you know, my company, I'm the owner, this, this, that. You know, it's people that are saying, how can I go make a difference in the world and how do I serve that community to the best of my abilities? You know, this is just important stuff not to not to get lost, not that any of you, I think, need that lesson, but it's still, you know, good to be reminded. Um, I want to make sure that there's time for everybody else, but what a pleasure, what a privilege, what an honor to be here with all of you. I, I look forward to connecting with every single one of you to the extent uh, we're able to do that. Sorry I'm so late both days in a row, but duty calls. Kam um, Samida, Thank you. Thank you. So we got a, there's a next lineup of events coming up. So let's move. We got to help them to prepare for the next event. We made this event so cheap because we are sharing the cost with the next event. So let's help. So let's move to the Chagall room and then let's connect there. There's a room next door, Chagall room. Thank you.